Hello, everyone. I'm Suzanne McGurn, President and CEO of CADETH. Au nom de tu organisation, je vous souhaite la bienvenue à cette séance d'information. On behalf of CADETH, I'm pleased to welcome you to today's virtual information session. Before we begin, I'd like to take a moment to acknowledge that the CADETH staff work in different locations across the country we know as Canada, residing on many traditional and, and treaty lands and collaborating with Indigenous governments, healthcare organizations, providers and community members. Personally, I was born in Canada and I, am a descendant, I, I believe, of the people from Ireland, England, Germany and France. I am speaking to you today from CADETH's Ottawa office which is on the unceded, unsurrendered territory of the Anishinaabe Algonquin Nation. CADETH recognizes the inherent treaty rights of, <clears throat> of all First Nations, Inuit and Métis people across this land. We are committed to moving forward in partnership with Indigenous communities in a spirit of reconciliation and collaboration. I would encourage everyone to think about where you are today and give thanks to the Indigenous peoples, past and present, who have continued to be protectors and sustainers of the land, keeping us whole for the future. We're here today to provide a progress report on the implementation of Ahead of the Curve, shaping future ready health systems, CADA's three-year strategic plan covering 2022 to 2025. It seems like a long time ago, but we just launched this plan back in April after months of hard work, gathering information and input across the health sectors and across all of the jurisdictions in Canada. Le plan mis sur nos forces comme notre leadership en nous soins for des sur des données probantes et notre role de PV à l'évaluation des technologies de la santé au Canada. Mais au vise aussi à nous propulser vers la vie à mater la, la CMTS au premier plan de gestation des technologies de la santé. The plan was designed to reinforce what we already do well, provide strong leadership in evidence-informed health care, and serve as a hub for health technology assessment in Canada. But it was also purposely intended to push us boldly into the future and put CADETH at the forefront of health technology management. It included a new purpose statement powering evidence-informed health technology decisions for a sustainable, world-class healthcare for all. To me, this statement conveys action, momentum, and impact, and it provides a precise description of our ambition and our aspirations. Our guiding principles, they've replaced our traditional values, excellence, responsiveness, collaboration, and transparency not because we don't still value those statements, but with guiding principles that are more specific to how we work, act, and engage with each other, our partners, and stakeholders. The principles that guide us provide the backbone for our corporate culture and drive our performance and impact. They include impact, agility, partnership, equity, diversity, and inclusion, and transparency. The final major building blocks of our plan are the three strategic pillars that form the foundation of our work going forward. So we're going to take a few minutes just to touch on each of those. So first off, anticipate. Early identification and assessment of promising technologies will enable their effective adoption and use to deliver the greatest value to health systems, patients, and populations. Our work with Indigenous communities also falls under this pillar. It's important for us to be anticipating for the future. We intend to continue to listen and learn and engage humbly with First Nation, Inuit and Métis peoples, communities, organizations and governments with the goal of contributing to Indigenous health and wellness. Pillar two, innovate. This pillar is focused on unleashing the value of technology across its lifespan. Real-world evidence is redefining how we understand and use evidence through, uh, about technology through their life cycles. And CADETH is stepping boldly into assuming a leadership role in shaping the pan-Canadian discussion on how to optimize the use of real-world evidence. The third and final pillar is transform, which outlines CADETH's role and aspirations to catalyze real health system change. 
COVID has shown us that rapid system change is possible. We've all had a glimpse of the incredible potential of technologies, digital platforms, and other te health technologies to transform healthcare delivery in Canada. At the same time, post-pandemic economic recovery will likely involve difficult choices. The appetite for change is strong. There are economic imperatives that just can't be ignored. Determining exactly how health systems will recover from COVID, COVID, including addressing backlogs, health human resource challenges, and a long list of things that are putting stresses on our system is an ongoing question. In this context, Cadith recognizes it has a once in a lifetime opportunity to show leadership and contribute to and drive transformational policy. We also recognize that we need to act differently, align with system-wide priorities, expand our networks, strengthen relationships, and deliver fit-for-purpose evidence, offering a more sophisticated support for the implementation of our advice and help mobilizing change. These new approaches are all essential elements of the transform pillar. Where we are is a paradigm shift in the way we approach our work at CADIF. Taken as a whole, these elements, our new organizational purpose, our guiding principles, and our strategic pillars represent a true new way of doing business for us. Our new approach emphasizes relationships as well as process. It commits us to shaping the future of healthcare in Canada in a spirit of partnership and collaboration with patient groups, with industry, with funders, with clinical decision makers, with the research community and the academic community and probably others, too many to mention. We also recognize the vital importance of communicating with our stakeholders regularly about the strategy so that it feels real and you can see our progress and hold us to account for how we are responding to shifting the, to the needs and new expectations. So that's what today is all about, providing a progress report on the implementation of our strategic plan to date. We are nearly three quarters of the way through our first year of the strategic plan. And if anything, the need for strategic initiatives outlined in the plan are even more necessary than ever. At this moment in time, COVID has been joined by, joined by the respiratory syncytial virus, RSV, and seasonal flu to in intensify the demands being placed on our health system that's already stressed and stretched. And the economic pressures on the health system continue to grow making the work that Cadith does increasingly vital, providing evidence to help support decision makers make those difficult choices. Fortunately, we are making great strides in terms of implementing our strategy and providing what we hope is the type of support that the health system needs during these challenging times. So, over the course of the next three hours, which seems like a long time standing up here at this moment, you're going to hear from members of the CADF executive team and some of our senior management about the progress we're making. I'm very proud to have members of my team be able to talk to you this afternoon about implementing key elements of CADF's strategic plan, affecting both manufacturer and payer-initiated pharmaceutical reviews, reshaping our medical devices and clinical interventions portfolio to address complex health technologies, complex information needs, and the ability to assess emerging technologies such as digital health. Providing us guidance on the best practices for the production of use of decision grade real world evidence, stepping out into that RWE space. Learning from and respectfully engaging with First Nations, Inuit and Métis peoples to ensure our work is relevant and hopefully beneficial to their communities and to extend our services further and more fully into the life cycle of health technologies through our post-market and drug evaluation or PMDE program. We'll also discuss some of the common misconceptions about CADIF. This is a new thing for us and I hope you like this part of the afternoon. And as is a tradition with our information sessions, we'll wrap up with an open forum where you can ask questions about the material covered today, or I say hesitantly, anything else that related to CADIF and its work. What we will do is we will hold most of the questions for the open forum, but if there is something that you don't understand in one of the presentations, we will take a few minutes at the end of each item just to check if there are any clarifications or quick check-ins time permitting. 
You can also enter your questions at any time into the Q&A tab. So with that, I'd like to start with our first presenter for this afternoon. We're going to start with updates from our pharmaceutical reviews portfolio. Uh, Brent Frazier, Vice President of Pharmaceutical Reviews, is on hand to answer questions. But this afternoon, we're first going to hear from uh, Amanda Allard, Director of Pharmaceutical Reviews, and Peter Deirda, Director of Pharmaceutical Policy and HTA, will also provide an update. With that, over to you, Amanda. Bonjour tout le monde. So this was my opportunity to use French, so I might repeat what Suzanne just said, but I'm, I'm going to go for it because I was pretty proud of it. So, so je m'appelle Amanda Allard et je suis la directrice de revue pharmaceutique chez ACTMS. Je vais commencer cette session avec un update pour les revues formulaires et ensuite je passerai le mic à mon collègue Peter Deirda. So luckily, I hope that made sense because I didn't actually use Google Translate for that, humble, humble brag. Um, and since Suzanne prefaced that with, um, with the introduction, I, I think we're all on the same page so we can, we can get going. All right, so this is me. So every time that we present, we mention that the volume and the complexity of, of reviews that has been coming to Cadiff has been increasing, increasing steadily and that we're being asked to do, to do more and to do it faster, but we've got the same number of resources. So rather than tell the same old story, I want to start off by congratulating the Pharmaceutical Reviews team for being able to prepare and pivot over the last year to ensure that all drug reimbursement reviews that came into Cadiff in 2022 have been completed within the timelines as outlined in our procedures and that we have not missed our 180 day performance metric once. So as highlighted on the slide, we have about 60 active reviews that are ongoing at any time. And with a team of about 40 people um, and files that can last between six to 10 months, um, this is no small feat. Our team is very busy. Um, in fact, we have done a record number of a total of 81 reviews so far this year, and it's not over yet. Um, also to point out, 64 of those 81 recommendations have been to reimburse with conditions, and Cadiff has issued 15 recommendations to not reimburse. So I'm very, very proud of all the work the team has been doing, um, not only this year, but even, even before that. And specifically with this past year, we've noticed a change. And part of this success is also due in part to the changing relationships that we've been able to form with industry and the meaningful discussions that we've been having during pre-submission meetings. We've noticed that overall, there's an increased willingness um, to share information. So this really does help our team prepare and anticipate um, what's coming our way. And as we're finally seeing the first reviews that are including the sponsor summary of clinical evidence, we're looking for even more ways to enhance our pre-submission meetings, to focus our dialogue on key components of the submission to help sponsors know um, what we need as we conduct our reviews. So there's a couple ways um, that you can help us prepare um, other than the pre-submission meeting, of course. If a product is coming, and it's anticipated to be disruptive, it's really much better to give us a heads up sooner than later so that we can be prepared earlier than later. And disruptive can mean a few different things, of course, right? It can be significantly changing clinical practice. It can be something that requires a new infra infrastructure um, to ensure access um, and implementation. Um, there may be uncertainty about who will actually pay for the new technology. Or it could be something as simple as a substantially different um, piece of information or methodology um, that, that is included in the review. So let us know, we can work it out and ensure that the review proceeds without delays. So one of the ways to engage with Cadiff early is to invite us to your pre-submission or pre-NDS meetings with Health Canada. We do attend those on a regular basis when we are invited and we do, we do find that they do help us prepare for what's coming down. Um, 
also, we know that a few of the, the sponsors out there engage in pipeline meetings with Health Canada. This even helps us prepare, um, look even for, more forward into the future. So if there's something that we need to um, you know, beef up on in terms of methods or training for our own team, that gives us time to do that as well. And the second is just reach out to us directly. Like if you've got something coming, you're not sure how it should be handled, you're not sure what to do with us, with it, um, we will accept meetings um, early on in, in select cases as well. Within formularium reviews, we, we see anticipating the types of drugs that are coming away, our way as a shared responsibility. So again, I can't underscore this enough, but please do ask early. Um, we have actually turned away submissions from companies who didn't follow our guidelines and didn't ask any questions. You know, and that kind of puts us in a really difficult spot because what are we supposed to do? So, so really, do please, please do get in touch because it can make a difference. So when you have a very well-defined process, as we do for our reimbursement reviews, it can seem like it's hard to be innovative but regulators are doing it as they're allowing for more agile processes. And we found and heard that the current recommendation framework doesn't always apply very well to certain situations that are really truly unique. So one of the things that we're doing um, in order to, to add maybe some flexibility and you know, make sure that we are addressing these unique situations um, in an innovative way is that we're thinking about implementing something called time-limited recommendations. I'm sure you've heard about this, this before as well. And for those of you that haven't, this is a recommendation that would hold for a period of time with the stipulation for further evidence generation to confirm um, any uncertainty that was present during the, the review. So this is something, again, we're still thinking about it. Right now, we have formed a working group um, with decision makers to make sure that the downstream players of the public reimbursement system are ready for it, whatever it is that does come their way. Um, and we are planning on implementing this in a phased approach when we are ready so as not to, to shock the system too, too much. The other thing that um, we are doing in terms of innovation um, is collaborating with international regulators. We're part of a working group that meets on a bi-monthly basis to discuss shared priorities to identify solutions to some of common challenges that we face. And one initiative that we're exploring is implementing joint approaches to engaging um, with regulatory agencies across um, the UK, Canada and Australia to identify and advance opportunities to improve HTA and regulatory collaboration. Now, this work is still in the very, very early stages, um, and really what we're focusing on at the moment is figuring out whether or not it's in fact feasible. So more to come on that um, in the future. So I don't want to get into the real world evidence too, too much here, as I know there's more to come on this later. But given all the work that's being done in this area, I do want to show um, the work that we've been doing um, on the pharmaceutical review side um, in collaboration with our evidence standards team to incorporate RWE um, throughout the reimbursement review process. Um, there's RWE guidance that is being developed to help um, sponsors and people that submit to CADETH during the application phase. We're also working on an RWE framework to help inform when and how RWE should be used within a reimbursement review. Things, things to, to consider, right, is whether or not it, the study itself should be included in the review, um, where in the review it should be featured, and how it's used in the discussion section and the appraisal and the interpretation of the evidence. We've already been discussing, of course, RWE um, with the expert committees. We've been providing guidance, um, but once the guidance um, and the framework document are complete, we'll be able to put this into pragmatic practice. And finally, we're assessing ways to communicate appropriately for each of these approaches that we're going to be developing in the framework so that readers of our recommendations will know how this evidence was used in the review and how it factored into the deliberations. So I've already mentioned that the reimbursement review process is, is no longer a one-size-fits-all, one-stop shop. We've taken steps to ensure that our process is flexible enough to allow for different approaches to be taken for some drugs. 
And this has largely been accomplished through the complex review process, which itself allows for greater consideration of non-randomized studies. It provides a more detailed examination of potential implementation issues, and it may include an additional review and consideration of potential ethical issues. All of this is information which provides a clearer picture to the expert committee and helps flag potential issues for public plans. So when determining whether or not a drug will benefit from a complex review, we consider a, a list of factors which I've shown on the screen there. And of course, cell and gene therapies, you know, they're, they're complex by default. default. Those, are, those are just another ballgame altogether. So while this list isn't completely definitive, and any product does not need to check all of these boxes to be considered complex, um, we consider the combination of factors as well as the therapeutic area and, and, and do the best that we can to, of course, get all the most relevant information um, to, our, to our advisory or our, our expert review committees um, with the least amount of gaps. So as one of the guiding principles of CADETH's strategic plan, we are committed to providing as much information as we can regarding our process and the factors that contribute to the decisions that are made by our expert committees, um, which in the pharmaceutical reviews are CDEC and PERC. And of course, CDEC is the committee that reviews the drugs for um, non-oncology um, indications, and PERC is our oncology expert review committee. So as of last month, um, you will see that we've made changes to some of our recommendations as a step towards increasing transparency. We've started adding additional information to recommendations that are made for reconsiderations so that everybody will know what information was considered by the expert committee and what key discussions factored into the decision for that recommendation. So this info will include a very high level summary of the issues that were identified by the sponsor or the drug plans as those are, those are the two parties that can in fact request a reconsideration for a, re a recommendation. Um, it will also include, um, sorry I lost my spot there. Yeah, it will also include um, the information that was considered by the expert committees, which typically includes um, feedback on the draft recommendations from the drug plans, um, the sponsor, the patient and clinician groups, and of course input from the clinical experts that were consulted by CADA throughout the duration of the review. We're planning on adding more information to the rationale um, as to why the recommendation was ended up as it was, um, to the extent, of course, that that information um, was a key reason for the recommendation. We'll also be um, adding discussion points to capture the key points that were raised by the committee as they pertain to each of the issues identified as part of the reconsideration. So I hope I've given you some insight into what we've been doing and where we're headed. And merci pour votre attention, et j'aimerais vous introduire Peter Dierda, Director of Pharmaceutical Policy and HTA, et j'espère que tout le monde passe des très heureuses fêtes. Merci. Thank you. Hello. Thanks for that, Amanda. Um, merci et bienvenue à tous. Ma présentation d'aujourd'hui sera en anglais. I'll be delivering this in English. That is the best French I can muster for this, but I did attempt. Uh, hello and welcome to everyone from coast to coast to coast across this country and our friends abroad out there in TV land. Actually, we saw before the meeting there's quite a few international uh, registrants, so we want to welcome you all as well. My name is Peter. I am the Director of Pharmaceutical Policy in HCA. I've just celebrated uh, two years here at Cadeth, and this is my second information session. Um, I want to address something, though. The last time uh, I was up here, I was accused of delivering uh, quote-unquote dad jokes, uh, which I took offense to. Uh, not because I, I'm not a dad, that's true, but that material slapped. And I think it, regardless of my parental status, I think it should have been um, valued in that way. So I've developed a dad complex now, thanks to this last meeting, and uh, I'm doing my best to shake it. So let's try. Um, on my side of pharmaceutical reviews, 
we focus on program and policy development and optimal use and formulary management. So put another way, we handle a lot of the jurisdictional or payer related questions, uh, which lead to reviews and analysis with an output of a health technology review, which may or may not result in a recommendation. Sometimes it's a report, sometimes it's advice, sometimes it goes to an expert committee for a full on recommendation. Similarly to Mandy, this presentation will be structured in the format of following our strategic pillars, followed by a brief discussion of how we are following our guiding principles from our aforementioned strategic plan. So with that intro, let's begin with anticipate. So in this past year, we have readied and empowered decision makers by providing outputs that were firmly grounded in thorough and practical evidence delivered in advance of a therapy's arrival or in a timely manner after a query was posed. So we have positioned Cadith as an enabler uh, of innovation. Uh, enabler is not positive in every context, but in this one, an enabler of innovation it is through the timely delivery of implementation advice. So bringing together experts into a panel to gather and provide advice on a topic. So you see there in the three sub bullets, the examples of where we've done that in the past year. So several therapeutics on infectious diseases for COVID and monkeypox, which everyone's familiar with. There's four of those. Uh, some work in drug supply shortages, so therapeutic alternatives there. That work is continuing with the Multi-Stakeholder Steering Committee, or MSSC, led by Health Canada, where we will work to uh, build upon that. And then provisional funding algorithms in oncology, of which there are now 20. Uh, five are active currently. One is collecting stakeholder feedback uh, for breast cancer. So please go online and provide feedback if that's relevant. So this has been sort of our deliverable for Anticipate for this past year. Innovate. So innovation is very important. Um, obviously, the focus has been on expanding methods to flexibly deliver the evidence. So bringing new pharmaceutical review products to the market to expeditiously answer payer questions. So we want to focus on assessing value across the life cycle uh, in a timely way, especially at the end of exclusivity where drugs go generic. Uh, Non-sponsored reimbursement reviews, you might recall, we talked about that at the last information session. Uh, so that has been launched and there are four active reviews, I'm happy to report. Uh, two in prostate, one in chronic kidney disease, and one for VTE, uh, venous thromboembolic events for the acronym uh, sensitive folks out there. Um, so non-sponsored reviews, if you recall, the whole intent is to repurpose old drugs. So old drugs with new indications where there isn't a sponsor, we act as the sponsor and we review it very similarly to a standard review. Uh, and that's been quite innovative for this year. We've also looked at therapeutic reviews and look to accelerate them in a fit for purpose manner by leveraging already published literature uh, and looking at it in spaces with less uncertainty. So the procedures for that you should expect to be published actually this month. Uh, that is my uh, Christmas present to Brent this year. So, Merry Christmas, Brent. Uh, lastly, innovating and collaborating on the use of RWE. Mandy had mentioned there's obviously, it's a big topic for us today. Uh, we've been using RWE a few ways in optimal use. So one, uh, for multiple myeloma, we have a therapeutic review. We're working internationally with some groups on putting together RWE in a global disease model. And secondly, in utilization analyses, working with groups like KaiHi, uh, the Canadian Institute for Health Information, uh, to assess the optimal use in disease areas like ulcerative colitis, uh, SMA, and type 2 diabetes, or spinal muscular atrophy. Um, and that has been the focus for Innovate. And lastly, transform. So our goal has really been to build a reputation as a leader in developing solutions to health system challenges uh, where understanding the evidence is critical. So uh, one of the things we're doing is an optimal use 360, which will be called an integrated tech review, looking at a modular approach at understanding a problem so that a decision maker can actually take the report and have an actionable item. Um, trying to simplify 
very difficult things into very small bite-sized actions. Uh, optimal use is not about disinvestment. Um, I know that's a, a topic that's come up. I think Terry will be touching on that. Uh, but it's about promoting maximal benefit or health outcomes in how health systems deploy their resources. So we will expand formulary management work, but it's all about uh, patient outcomes first. And for my last slide, what I have here are all of our guiding principles. So here's how we have tried to employ these uh, throughout the year. So for impact, it's all about optimal use, which I've touched on already, uh, but it's taking insights and turning them into advice and recommendations. So we want to get away from just publishing reports and actually publishing reports with recommendations. Uh, agility, it's about new products, uh, streamlining products, which we've touched on. Uh, partnerships, so building meaningful relationships uh, domestically and abroad. So with uh, Kai Hai, which I've mentioned, and Kalia, the private insurance industry, domestically, and then uh, HTAs like NICE and Zin abroad. Uh, equity, diversity, and inclusion. It's all about uh, social considerations when assessing evidence, which Laura will touch on um, later on in her presentation as well. Uh, and then transparency. So what are we working on? How do we communicate that clearly? We've actually added a tab on the website for topics under considerations that you can now go in today and click and see all the topics that our team is considering when we're thinking about what kind of products we'll be using so that there's maximal transparency in terms of what is being done on our end. So with that, I will turn it back over uh, to Suzanne. Thank you. Merci, Mandy and Peter. Um, and. Uh, First off, I would say um, Mandy's much better at pr uh, pronouncing uh, French than I am, so appreciate the effort, Mandy. Um, for those of you who do see me with my phone in my hand as the day goes on, I just want to let you know that that's how questions are getting to me. Um, we do have a few minutes in this section left, so there, there is a, a, a question that I'm going to flag for you, Mandy. Um, it may be a bit, a bit larger than just you, but if you want to come back up and perhaps uh, uh, speak to, to it quickly. Um, if my phone reopens, which it's of course not doing at this moment, there we go. Um, so the question is, uh, it's a really great opportunity uh, to hear more about CADA's work, and is, are there any preliminary thoughts on how patients and caregivers and patient organizations will be engaged in time-limited recommendation, and how will that, this interface with RWE in the future? So that is an absolutely fantastic question. And I think with our time-limited recommendations, right, we're still at the phase where we are really still trying to figure things out. Um, so we are still putting the pieces together ourselves. So I don't actually, at this time, I don't have an answer for you. Um, but we are going to ensure, of course, that all of our stakeholders are involved in this process. Um, we want to be sure, as we are with, with all of our recommendations currently, um, that the patient voice is represented, um, as well as um, clinicians and the clinician groups, as well as the drug plans and and, um, of course, the sponsors. Thank you. We always like great questions, especially ones that make sure that uh, they're proactive and get us thinking even before we've gotten to those places. So thank you. Um, so next up, I'd like to introduce uh, Dr. Leslie Dunfield, our Vice President of Medical Devices and Clinical Interventions. Um, over to you, Leslie. Thanks, Suzanne, and thanks to everybody who has joined us today. I'm going to be reviewing some of the work that we have underway and are considering for the Medical Devices and Clinical Interventions Directorate. And with the, on the basis of the strategic plan, as well as the three pillars that we've heard about today with innovate, anticipate, and transform, and the focus of the needs of senior healthcare decision makers, as well as the fact that there are more complex problems and more complex technologies coming to us, it is time to reshape the work of the Medical Devices and Clinical Interventions Directorate. The time and the, the number of requests that we get for single technologies for single populations is less common now, where we're getting more questions that are very complex for complex um, conditions and health system, health system questions. 
And so it's time to reflect on what we do and how we can better meet the needs. And the first activity that we did to help inform some of this reshaping was holding a health leader summit. In the fall of 2022, we convened a group of health leaders from across ministries, provincial, federal, and territorial. We also included chairs of the two device committees, the device advisory committee, as well as the health technology expert review panel. We held this work to hear from senior health leaders what the challenges are what their needs were related to medical devices and clinical interventions, particularly with decision making, and then determine what those gaps are, what the needs are, and how CADETH can better support their needs. From the findings of the Health Leaders Summit, from the findings of the Health Leaders Summit, there were four themes and insights that emerged. So what we heard from the summit was that provincial and territorial partners want clear and actionable recommendations. And this isn't limited to recommendations, it's also about the conclusions, really wanting our conclusions for the work that we do to be clear and our recommendations to be actionable. We also heard that jurisdictions wanted advice on disinvestment, disinvestment of technologies. And this was more about when we do de deliver recommendations for um, offering or adoption of a new technology, what does that mean for what's already on the table? What does that, what then has to come off to allow for funding for this new technology? The third theme and insight was about the awareness uh, regarding the work of medical devices and clinical interventions. And this wasn't so much related to not knowing that we existed, but rather knowing what type of work that we did, what types of work we can do, um, but also the types of interventions that fall within medical devices and clinical interventions. So in addition to a medical device, we're also looking at diagnostic tests, procedures, uh, other types of interventions, behavioral interventions, um, and surgical procedures. So it does cover quite a bit more than medical devices and clinical interventions. We also do a number of types, different types of reports within medical devices and clinical interventions, such as the rapid response program. So the rapid reviews all come through the program, horizon scanning, environmental scanning, the work of the Canadian Medical Imaging Inventory falls under, under this portfolio as well as the work on digital health, which you will hear about later. Also with the lack of awareness, it might be that there is a diffuse decision-making decision -making landscape across the country related to adoption of medical devices. And so decisions might be made at a ministry level or a hospital level. And so this might add to some of the complexity and awareness around the work that we do and can do to support decision-making. And the next one was about the proactive work and finding out from the summit that decision makers do have an interest in learning about what is coming down the pipeline and those emerging technologies and the emerging challenges, but they really are busy. Um, and so we've heard a lot about the challenges with health human resources. And so they are tasked with reacting all of the time. And so not really leaving enough space and time to, for those proactive challenges and that planning and preparedness. So based on what we heard from the Health Leaders Summit, as well as what we've heard in other stakeholder engagement from our committees, as well as from our board, we're looking at three broad areas to develop for the portfolio. The first one is that enhanced communication and awareness of the work that we do. And I've been going between calling us medical devices and clinical interventions to just medical devices, to devices, to devices and interventions. Um, so our name might be a little bit problematic. And it does cover quite a bit more than what falls under medical devices and clinical interventions. But there's also an opportunity for us to promote the work that we do differently, um, do a better job with that dissemination and the awareness and, uh, and how we publish our work. And so there are plans underway to, to consider how we can do some more of this awareness building. The next one is about upda updating our approach to meet the needs of senior healthcare decision makers. And this is a bit about what we can do, but also how we can do it. And so with the types of work we, we do, and one of the things we heard was that clear, clear conclusions, clear recommendations. And so really working towards making sure we are building that into our reports and that what we are producing um, is actionable. 
Um, the types of recommendations as well, and this came up from what we heard, and so implementation recommendations. If a jurisdiction um, is looking to implement a technology but is having some, has some questions or is struggling perhaps to implement that, then what can CADF do to support that? And we have um, done some implementation recommendations in the past um, with some emerging technologies. Um, as well, system readiness recommendations. And with emerging technologies that are up and coming, we might be able to provide some information on what the system needs to have in place before this technology hits the system. Um, and back in the summer of 2022, we developed recommendations on um, stem cell transplant for MS, which is um, an emerging technology. And so these recommendations were speaking to what needs to be in place if jurisdictions are to start offering this treatment. And all of this work with updating our approach and the types of recommendations will include discussions with our health technology expert review panel who works with us to develop our recommendations. And then finally, the last broad area to develop is the increased engagement and collaboration. And so with increased engagement, um, what we heard at the summit was there was an appetite to have those types of discussions. Um, and so convening those senior healthcare decision makers more often or regularly, but also to um, continue to engage with others. Uh, perhaps the surveys were, were a way to do that as well and some additional roundtables. We're also working with our device advisory committee for how we can use the information that they can provide us better and differently and how we can work with them more efficiently. Um, the device advisory committee, a jurisdictional representation, so how can we get the information from them, but also how can they bring information to us from the jurisdictions, and then how can we work together to make sure we're actioning some of the advice that they are providing to us. And then finally, with the collaboration, we work very closely with the Pan-Canadian HTA collaborate, Collaborative um, group of uh, HTA organizations across the country. Um, this has been a collaboration for a few years, but there's an interest in more deliberate collaboration with this group. And we do have a couple of HTAs ongoing in collaboration with members of the Pan-Canadian HTA Collaborative, and definitely an interest and an appetite in more of that, as well as um, additional initiatives with the Pan-Canadian HTA Collaborative. And then finally, before I pass it over, a couple of initiatives that are underway that speak to some of those areas um, in development, as well as some of the, the pillars within the strategic plan, such as the transform pillar. And so one of them is genetic testing for precision medicine. And we're working with experts across the country to develop a national framework for the assessment related to adoption of genetic tests for diagnosis, prognosis, and prediction of therapeutic response. And we convened a group of experts in November to talk about what is being done now in the jurisdictions, how these genetic tests are being assessed, what the gaps are. There's a lot of inconsistency across the country with how things are assessed and what is funded and what is offered. And so working with this group to, to develop a national framework to, with the goal to increase that efficiency, reduce duplication of, of effort, um, and really add to the equity of access to these tests across the country. We are planning to um, focus on oncology right now, uh, recognizing though that precision medicine and genetic testing can be much broader than that into, ad into additional uh, indications. And we are also planning for expanded engagement as we progress with this work. We just had the first roundtable in November, and so the work is ongoing, but in future we do plan for expanded engagement with industry and patient partners. And then finally, the work of the Canadian Medical Imaging Inventory. This is a program that we've talked about um, probably at all of the past information sessions where we are currently embarking on um, planning for the next iteration of the survey and data collection for 2023 version of the Canadian Medical Imaging Inventory. This inventory is a collection of data about specialized imaging modalities, the location, their usage, the numbers, the age, a lot of information gets collected um, and used by the jurisdictions for equipment planning and other, other decision making. And so with the, with the Canadian Medical Imaging Inventory, we've also been taking requests for additional information or, or different types of analysis with the data that we already have within the Canadian Medical Imaging Inventory. And so this has been ongoing for a couple of years and is offered to those who have provided us information to inform the inventory. So those who have given us data, we're, we're now able to um, provide them with different types of reports 
based on that data um, with the hope to be able to expand this further. And in the past two years, we've completed about 50 of these types of requests. We are currently also addressing those types of requests uh, internally to support some of the internal work with reimbursement reviews. And so drugs that are going through the formulary review program that have imaging implications, we can then support that, that the, those reports with data from the Canadian Medical Imaging Inventory. And then hopes to continue to expand and further develop the work of the inventory. There are a number of other imaging modalities that aren't currently captured, but there, we're, we hear that there is an interest in adding some of those modalities as well as expanding um, some of the customer base for the service requests. And that is it for me, and I'm going to turn it over now to Laura Weeks, Director of HTA, and she's gonna go into a little bit more about the complex technologies and the complex information needs. Following Laura, we'll then hear from Joanne Kim, who will talk about the initiative of digital health. Laura? Thank you, Leslie. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. So I'm going, as Leslie mentioned, I'm going to build on her content by describing um, some of the strategies that we're um, using and have tried to innovate our program um, in response to and uh, in anticipation of um, emerging complexities in terms of health technologies and information needs in today's context. Um, so first, just a bit of context and detail around what we're hearing and observing in, um, as drivers of change in terms of how we approach some of our work. Um, first, and you know, Amanda mentioned the same thing uh, for our drug portfolio, is that health technologies are just becoming increasingly complex um, or unique in terms of their delivery and design. And this has compelled us to take a look at our assessment processes to ensure that they can reflect this complexity and so that we too can innovate to ensure that we have the best evidence to inform decisions. And at least somewhat related and at the same time that we're assessing increasingly complex technologies, information needs to support decisions that reflect a range of social values are also increasing. And again, this has compelled us to look at um, our uh, methods and innovate our approaches to evidence appraisal. Um, and just as we you know one example, we're aware that any technology that has an automated intelligence feature automatically raises some unique ethical considerations that need to be considered within decision making. Um, healthcare's contribution to greenhouse gas emissions and climate change is also receiving increasing attention and this has compelled us as part of our strategic plan um, to begin developing a new strategy for our work that also includes environmental considerations. And of course there's other drivers as well and Leslie mentioned near the end of her talk that people are not just asking us for recommendations but once you have a recommendation how am I going to implement that recommendation so we're beginning to innovate to look at in that space as well. And then finally, we're aware and observing that the sorts of questions that are being asked of Cadith are not the typical discrete questions about what should I do for this technology for this particular condition, but instead we're hearing broader questions around models of care or broader health conditions or health systems needs. And so in short, health technologies are changing, information needs are changing, and the questions that people are asking of Cadith are changing. And so we're also changing and innovating our approach um, to our work in response. And so for my time today, I'm going to walk through just a few initiatives that are underway within the Medical Devices Directorate. I'm, of course, working collaboratively across Cadith teams as well that are in response to the complexity that we've been um, observing in terms of technologies and information needs. So the first is around like broader packages um, of work and we don't really have a name for, <laughs> for this yet, but um, one good example of um, how we've developed a package of work to respond to complex health systems needs is our work on post-COVID condition or long COVID. So within this program of work, we've used some different strategies to identify, prioritize, and respond to um, complex information needs um, while keeping an eye to innovation, really trying to support collaboration and reducing duplication of effort. And I think we learned a lot in this program of work that we can bring forward to support similarly challenging and complex um, health system decisions in the future. So one aspect um, of this package of work that I will highlight is that this, um, this work saw Cadith step into the strategic role of convening health systems leaders um, and stakeholders. We established a multi-stakeholder panel to support the overall direction for the work, um, which also supported us in making connections across jurisdictions um, and also helped us uh, to broadly support and mobilize the results. 
We also hosted um, a roundtable event on post-COVID models of care, uh, which saw us convene um, senior decision makers from all provinces and territories, including federal programs. And this was so that everyone can learn from one another and um, seek system solutions together to, um, to, to the identified challenges. And what we've heard through these interactions is that CADF playing this convening function was really valued as a way to efficiently gather diverse perspectives, support collaboration, and really support the reduction of duplication of effort, especially in this time of scarce healthcare resources. And we've heard a call for CADF to continue maintaining this role and playing a convening function. Um, finally, just uh, throughout this particular project on post-COVID condition, we had the opportunity to explore new collaborations, try new methods, and have also begun to explore um, some new publishing strategies, really capitalizing on digital platforms. Um, and again, these just showcase different opportunities and strategies that we'll continue to explore to move forward um, uh, to support other complex health technology and information needs. to advance my slide. There we go. <laughs> so moving more from the complex problems to the complex information needs, I just wanted to talk a little bit about environmental considerations. So as part of the anticipate pillar in our new strategic plan, we've committed to adapting um, our methods and analyses to include environmental considerations. And first and foremost, Cadith is stepping into this space, acknowledging the contribution that healthcare is having towards climate change and accepting our responsibility to influence environmentally sustainable health systems through engagement with our stakeholders as well as through our individual assessments. So inclusion of environmental considerations is a relatively new area for HTA and there are many questions around what is the specific role of HTA agencies versus other stakeholders. And we're trying to think through where there might be opportunity for HTA organizations and HTA processes to have influence. And so to this end and to support the development of CADA strategy, we're partnering formally and informally um, with HTA colleagues and stakeholders as one example through Anata's learning group um, on environmental sustainability. And here we get together to discuss the issues, problematize some of the challenges, and talk through potential solutions to learn together. And I did want to say, like, it is top of mind for us that any efforts to develop a strategy to include environmental considerations need to have impact and need to be used by our healthcare decision makers. And so we have a few initiatives on the way to begin to understand the specific needs of our decision makers. Um, and the first is the development of a horizon scan, which I'll, I've described as sort of a primer on environmental and green initiatives in healthcare. Um, and this report should be ready in the new year. And it's looking at clinical initiatives and activities in Canada and internationally that address environmental sustainability and climate change. We've also got an environmental scan underway that aims to position HTA in support of environmental sustainability through the promotion um, of reduction of unnecessary care and also the appropriate use of health technology across the life cycle. We're also trying to understand the current policy and healthcare environment to help us understand where, where HTA might fit in and have, has the most opportunity to influence. And then finally, we intend these activities to inform a roundtable event, um, again, capitalizing on CADIS' position to play a convening function where appropriate, and also to work with our pan-Canadian HTA collaborative colleagues in this space. And then um, similarly, in terms of what we're asking to do being uh, more of in, in the space of equity, diversity, and inclusion, and similar to with environmental considerations in our strategic plan, we likewise identified equity, diversity, and inclusion as guiding principles, and again committed to adapting our methodologies to include equity considerations in response to the imperative for healthcare organizations to work towards removing health inequities that are inherent in our system. I do want to note that equity is already embedded in some of CADIS processes, including as a value for patient involvement, and it's also a starting point um, in our guidelines for the economic evaluation of health technologies. And then the challenge before us now is to introduce a structured and systematic approach to consider health equity across all of our work and also increase transparency and awareness about where and how equity considerations are being considered. We have had the opportunity with the recent HTA on peer support, pro peer support programs for mental health to use a published tool called the Equity Checklist for HTA, and we use this um, as a test to guide our approach for considerations of equity in HTA. And this was definitely a success towards our strategy to adapt our methodologies, and as a, um, as a recent example of moving this thinking into different programs of work, including HTA. And I know similar work is also going on within the complex um, reimbursement review process. 
So next steps for CADETH include formalizing um, a CADETH-wide approach and supporting some internal training and process refinement. So I'm going to close there uh, with my update, mostly intended to provide a broad overview of some strategies that we're implementing to innovate and adapt our processes and assessments to respond to the current um, health system context. So I believe I'm passing it over now to my colleague virtually, Joanne. Hi, Joanne. Hi, Laura. Thanks for that. Thanks, Leslie. Hello, everyone. My name is Joanne Kim, and I'm a clinical research manager at CADIS. Today, I'll provide a quick update on CADET's work and current thinking in digital health. Next slide, please. Both Leslie and Laura have spoken about complex health technologies, and I'll certainly continue on that theme with this topic. Digital health, as you may know, uh, represents many complex health technologies and it is one of um, CADET's priority areas identified in our strategic plan. CADETH has already done a lot of work in this space. Um, just to mention a few from this calendar year alone, we've done a horizon scan on continuous learning artificial intelligence, an HTA on internet-based cognitive behavior therapy, and rapid scoping on virtual care. We have a lot more on the go, including a horizon scan in augmented reality and an environmental scan of virtual care from Indigenous perspectives. Next slide, please. Our 2022 Health Technology Trends Watch List, uh, which is another report published earlier this year, identified several digital health interventions. One click on the slide, please. These include remote care, mobile health, and artificial intelligence, suggesting that we'll continue to see more innovation and therefore more work in this area. Next slide, please. So far, our existing HTA methods and process for medical devices and clinical interventions have served us well in evaluating digital health, all of which have been in the space of virtual care. With all the innovation in this space, we are seeing more and more advanced and specialized technologies, which look at least somewhat different from our usual traditional devices or interventions. With that, we've been thinking about which technologies to review, whether we can use our existing methods and process to evaluate these technologies, and what else we might need to consider in our evaluations. This is still ongoing work, but today I'll tell you a bit about what we've been up to and where we're headed. To inform our thinking about how to evaluate digital health, we took on a number of activities, including consulting the literature and actively connecting with other Canadian and international organizations to share information and align and collaborate where possible. It didn't take us long to learn that many other organizations are also wondering exactly how to assess these technologies. We also learned that there are many frameworks specific to the evaluation of digital health technologies and even some syntheses to compare and combine these frameworks. Next slide, please. So from our survey of the literature and our interactions with many partner organizations, here are our learnings to date and plans for moving forward. We want to first acknowledge that this is an evolving area. Changes are expected and future updates in our thinking and approaches are also expected. With that, the overarching idea is that current digital health technologies present some, but not all, new and unique challenges to HTA. In terms of what's in scope for our evaluations, similar to our usual scope, our reviews will focus on devices and interventions for medical purposes with direct impact on health outcomes. In terms of methods, existing HTA frameworks will still apply, but additional considerations for digital health in general or specific types such as artificial intelligence will be added on. In terms of process, we're looking at a few different ideas. Some of the new considerations, which may be new to CADETH and other HTA organizations, such as data considerations and legal considerations, will likely be assessed by external experts. Some domains and considerations will be assessed in foundational or stock reviews and or in different stages. And version updates and artificial intelligence that change over time can be handled through reassessments, meaning we'll likely need to look at these technologies again after the initial assessment. We recognize that future innovation and in digital health might look quite different, and we will be keeping an eye on the developments and updating our plans moving forward. With that, I'll turn it um, back over to Suzanne in the room.
Merci and thank you, Leslie, Laura, and Joanne. Uh, we're going to actually, I can tell you your um, session actually raised a number of questions and we've got a few minutes, so um, I'm going to ask those. Um, and maybe I'll just double check. Uh, can Leslie respond from where she is uh, sitting at the table? Uh, perfect. So Leslie, maybe a first couple of questions to you. Um, when you talked about your leader summit uh, regarding um, uh, healthcare devices, did you have the opportunity to get input from clinical and frontline levels at this point? Uh, at this point with the Health Leader Summit, we did, uh, it was an invitation only event um, and focusing on uh, deputy ministers, ADMs within the healthcare um, system. And so at this point, we haven't gone there yet. However, we have plans uh, in the future once we further develop the reshaping and some of the activities that we're going to do, we will be reaching back out to those who participated in the Health Leader Summit, um, but we'll also do additional engagement there as well because we do want to make sure that those needs are um, captured within the work that we're doing. We also do have other ways to gather input from, from the jurisdictions and the front line with, with other connections that we have across the jurisdictions, um, so we do regularly get some of that information as well. Your summits were a hot topic. Um, so there was a second question, and it's related to uh, the recent summit on genetic testing. Is it possible to get a summary of the conclusions uh, for the genetic testing for precision medicine? And are there ways, for example, of industry partners to get involved? Uh, absolutely. Um, so we are still um, working on the summary, the What We Heard report from the Genetic Testing Roundtable. And so once we do have that and we've shared it with the participants as well as internally and any other stakeholders, then we would be in the position to be able to share that. Um, but that is work in progress at this point. And in terms of industry involvement, so as part of the expanded engagement that I mentioned at the end, we are including industry in that. Um, I've already had a few reach out um, with that interest in being engaged in the next steps. And so at this point, if, if there is that interest, if I haven't already heard from you, um, let me know and we, we are keeping that list of industry for the future engagement with, with the next steps with the work. We're not quite done yet. As I said, you got a few questions in this section. First off, though, I want to—I do want to share, share a comment because it is something that uh, we have talked about a lot of times here at CADF and actually was a big uh, part of the conversation about the language we used in the strategic plan. So I thought it was just worth flagging here. Um, and uh, one of our audience participants uh, recognized your salient point regarding the problems of, of name of MDCI. And that in the, in the literature, non-pharmaceutical interventions or non-pharmacological non interventions is the most clear and accurate description and it's, it's widely recognized. And we have had that conversation, I just want to share. It's so hard to be defined as something that you're not. And so I, I did just want to recognize that. And maybe there's one more question, Leslie, um, that I, I, I'm just wondering, I'm not sure if you're the right person, but I'll turn it to you first. Um, is there an environmental scan on or guidance on validating digital health tools as part of CADA's upcoming work? Um, the, the questioner uh, draws attention to the fact that patients are interfacing with these tools constantly and it can be very challenging to actually determine whether their info and tools are valid or correct. Um, so any comment? I'm going to, I see Joanne is still on the screen, so I'm wondering if she has any information about that and would be able to, to provide that. Um, we did recently do an environmental scan looking at di different um, evaluative frameworks that exist in the space of virtual care. Um, I think this, the, the question, Suzanne, was uh, broadly for digital health or was it something else? It's, it's for digital health tools that patients are having to interface with. Okay, I think some of those evaluative frameworks might be useful in looking at uh, what those tools um, look like, uh, the different components and whatnot. Um, but if, um, if there's uh, sort of more details on what digital tools they might look like, um, perhaps we can uh, provide more information on that. Thank you for that. 
Um, again, thank you all for the, the uh, session and obviously raised lots of questions at this point. For anyone who um, has questions either about the pharmaceutical portion or this last piece, please continue to put them in the chat. I will use them at the end of, of the session. But at this point, um, I'd like to turn it over to Dr. Nicole <coughs> Mittman, CADA's Chief Scientist and Vice President uh, Evidence Standards, for an update on the development of real-world evidence guidance. So, bonjour tout le monde, je m'appelle Nicole Mittman. Um, I wanted to take account of how many times RWE was mentioned already in the previous presentations, and I'm at four. Um, and so we'll elaborate a little bit more on the presentation today. So I thought I would start out with a definition because real world evidence can mean everything and nothing to everybody. Um, and what we're really talking about is evidence created outside of a randomized clinical trial in a usual care practice pattern. Um, and it can be for safety, for utilization, for effectiveness, and really for a drug, a technology, um, or any kind of product out there. And as we're starting to think about uh, focusing on perhaps pharmaceuticals first, and then maybe, as per the last comment, non-pharmaceuticals, um, there's an opportunity to make sure that as we move forward, we actually start to define and are able to accommodate all different types of technologies. So I, this I just wanted to point out is that Cadeth has always, uh, well, already uh, used or accepted real-world evidence. And so part of this is based on the work that we do. We accept data on drug utilization. We accept data on patient-reported outcomes. We accept data on uh, quality of life or health utility values. So as part of the work and the standard of work that we do, but this report here through the Economist Impact actually highlighted that we were in line with another organization organization uh, in the UK, NICE, that looked at, for specific products, what kind of evidence was included and then reviewed. And so in the circle, you will see that uh, retrospective studies were included, perhaps prospective studies, and also different kinds of methodologies used for uh, evaluating evidence that happens in real world space. So we're actually moving forward along with already how we would have reviewed or accepted real world evidence. So as we think about our, our pillars, so anticipate and innovate and transform, what's the purpose of doing this work and what are our goals for RWE? Uh, certainly for providing learnings for working in the rare disease space because we often know that uh, randomized clinical trials or the evidence in the rare disease space may not be robust enough. Uh, it may not have a comparator. It may not be long enough. It may, these kinds of opportunities or trials may not have uh, evidence that includes the right population. So as we think about a number of uncertainties in the rare disease space, there's an opportunity to think about real world evidence evidence and certainly as a complementary function. And then how do we use that work internally? So as we develop methods and strategies and guidance to help our, our own appraisal work, but also help for those uh, to submit and actually put in submissions for our organization. So really what RWE is about is understanding the data, understanding where the data is, understanding the quality of the data, understanding the methodologies of around how that analysis was conducted, and then also trusting that you can actually uh, understand what the quality or the rigor of that particular data set is. For those folks who understand the randomized controlled trial world, we take for granted that there's a protocol. We take for granted that there is an informed consent form. We take for granted that there is a time limit and outcomes are there in a data safety monitoring board. None of that is explicitly clear in a study that's an observational study. And we're, one of the ways that we're trying to move this forward is by actually talking about what kind of standards or principles are required as you start to talk about real world evidence. It's also about collaboration and coordination. So it takes a number of stakeholders to talk about the evidence needs, the evidence gaps, and then to ensure that all voices are being heard at the table. And that includes not only patients and clinicians, but payers, but then also the methodologists or the data holders along the way. And who is doing what? So establishing roles and responsibilities. So understanding who's responsible for collecting the data, who's responsible for analyzing the data, and who's actually responsible then for taking that data and deliberating about it, and how do we deliberate? 
So we held a best brains exchange in early 2021 um, and really brought together a number of stakeholders across the country where we uh, talked about principles of real world evidence and really what are the core things that we need to think about. And it was about do we have a data repository and Canada is actually rich in data, but how do we utilize that data? And do we have the right kind of resources or stakeholders in place to help us all move the ball down the field together? together. So this was a report that was published that talked about some of those highlights. I want the, the collaboration part should not be minimized. The fact that we need a number of individuals, a number of organizations to think about how we can collectively look at data, analyze data, and utilize data along the way is really important for us. So CADF, along with Health Canada, co-chairs the RWE Steering Committee, uh, where we have payers, uh, data holders, we have industry at the table, we have methodologists at the table, we have patient groups at the table as well, along with researchers. And so as we think about how do we do this work collectively, this group was brought together to think about learning projects and where are we, where do we are uncertain, where are we uncertain in the population or in doing the analysis and to help us move that forward. So one of the first ways we started to talk about was if we've gone, um, for those of you who are in the RWE space, you've probably heard, we have a lot of data but no methods. Or you've heard the exact opposite, we have methods but no data. And so part of this work was if we were going to embark on something like, for example, a reassessment or time-limited reviews, how do we actually ensure that we actually have data that could answer those questions? It doesn't make any sense for us to have that kind of stipulation or uh, 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 agreement if there isn't actually information that's available. So as we were start, starting to think about where is the data available, starting to reach out to other databases, how can we access it? Um, and there are a number of players in the system, including uh, CAIHI, Statistics Canada, and even our Health Data Research Network. And those are really from the ad administrative data set. And so here's another way of sort of compiling data. You know, we think about where do we find drug information, and there are a number of different sources. It could be private in, uh, sources, could be public sources, could be unique uh, companies or organizations that hold certain uh, portions of the, uh, uh, the utilization data set as well. Um, and where would we find information about out-of-pocket uh, costs as well as hospital costs? So we have gone through an inventory exercise to say where could we find this data if we had a question to answer something that would be uncertain uh, as we are looking looking at the evidence along the way. And then along with patient information, where could we find that information and when work, and you'll see some, up, uh, allude to some registry work coming up. So here's one of the things that we started to do is we know that there's a lot of patient registries. Do we know um, the quality of those particular registries? And there's a tool that was created by the European Health Technology Assessment Organizations that was called the Request Tool, and it actually looks at what are core and essential elements that are required for registries. And as you think about different registries that you might be familiar with, they could be industry funded, they could be grant funded, they could be clinician based, they could be patient organization based, uh, and they could be uh, payer or public payer based as well. So, or a hybrid or a mix of all of those along the way. And there's a real sort of transformation of could we use registry information because as mentioned previously, administrative data might not have all of the information that you want to answer a question if you're uncertain about something. Could we leverage the registry data? So we had an exercise where we went through and worked with 25 different uh, 25 different rare disease registries to look at what are the elements that each of these registries have uh, and then start to think about what that what is the quality and what information do we need to help us make with uh, decisions along the way and as you can imagine patients who are enrolled in a registry some may have consented to be part of the registry but not part of an analysis that could be used for decision making so some of the work is to understand you know what are the core sort of skills or quality or rigorous elements required uh, we're also looking at learning by doing projects, so not only focusing on the data, but how do we find it and can we ask questions about it uh, and then collaborate with a number of stakeholders along the way. And so these are, we call them our learning by doing projects. There's a number that we're working on in the pediatric space and in some adult spaces as well in the rare disease space really trying to think about how do we bring stakeholders together, how do we understand the outcomes, what are the uncertainties that need to be measured, and where could we measure them. So there are a number of initiatives going on in that particular space. 
And then it's all fine and dandy to have lists of uh, data tables or information about where things are housed and how to access, but how do we utilize that here at Cadath? So the internal work that I spoke of earlier is not just then providing where's the infrastructure required, but how do we implement it? How do we create standards? How do we create appraisal tools? How do we look at the data that's either being submitted or that we review? And so enabling us to look through from a quality point of view, create um, some education and or training for either our external partners and our internal partners as well. So uh, this was uh, launched early in uh, or in November, and this is our we launched our RWE guidance document. So these are this document is, are the principles of uh, conducting RWE and how to explicitly or transparently report RWE. It is out for consultation now, uh, created by a, a number of individuals who are, are the methodologists, and then now out for consultation so that we can hear practically how to apply this work. So it's open until January 6. So please, if you have any chance to do so, um, please review and provide your comments. And maybe the last uh, last two things I'll talk about would be the guidance for uh, Canadian rare disease registries. Again, mentioned that we looked at the request tool and the quality of those particular registries, and now we're looking at broadly, environmentally, and, and internationally about the quality of the particular registries out there and what are sort of core principles that we need to have. The last thing is we have an early scientific advice program and Cadeth has started to look at the advice not only from the early stage but also along the life cycle and provide guidance on outcomes for RWE and, and, and study designs for RWE. So as we're thinking about embedding this work into Cadeth, you know, starting early in the drug technology space all the way to the end of the life cycle. And with that, do I turn it over to you before the break? <laughs> Something that rarely happens. We're actually ahead of schedule, which is nice. Um, do you have a few questions? Um, so um, maybe w what we'll do is actually there was a question asked earlier in the session, um, Nicole, that I actually held for you because I think um, perhaps your it's your it's the vision of the work you're doing. Um, so one of the the questions that came up is is the revision for RWUE to be used more downstream? Um, in either, for example, in the reimbursement journey or to support FPT jurisdictions um, in having discussions about formulary listings, outcome-based agreements. And I know this is a question we get asked a lot. Yeah, and, and that's a great question. I think that uh, we're actually looking at RWE across the life cycle. So I just mentioned the last slide was early scientific advice. But there is an opportunity to look beyond the approval, beyond the recommendation, beyond the access, is to see if the if what's happening in the space beyond that. Because we don't know what happens beyond a clinical trial. All we can do is, is hope that everything works out. Um, if we can start to measure the safety or look at harms or look at outcomes around effectiveness, this is an opportunity to do that and even perhaps this is an opportunity beyond as we think about how to incorporate it into the system you know, how do we embed that kind of thinking and data and work into the uh, reassessment space or in our t into our time limited reviews the other uh, theme that keeps coming up in the questions Nicole is how do how are we in um, involving patients whether it's in the work that was talked about um, by Leslie or the pharmaceutical group like how is it that we're involving patients in the work we do here and uh, with you having the the methods and sort of pulling these things together can you talk a little bit about how patients are being engaged um, not just in RWE but across the yeah. the gamut of the programs here yeah thanks for that I mean I think it Everything we do is actually at the end of patients actually are either beneficiaries of. And so uh, we incorporate their knowledge, the insights, their information along through pharmaceutical reviews, or if we have a technology, we understand needs or quality of life. And we have a number of different ways that we reach out to patient groups. Uh, one is reaching out to patient uh, groups themselves uh, through feedback and written feedback for our pharmaceutical reviews. There are other ways that we bring in patients to help advise us on unmet need or burden to particular patients, and that comes through for the uh, device space as well. Um, and so really there's a, a, a broad effort at the organization to connect with patients. And I think at last count we had 17 different ways that we actually connect with patients along the way. Um, but really it's the insight and understanding the needs that help us really inform the decision making along the way. Thanks. 
We have had a few other questions come in for some of the earlier presentations, but I'm gonna hold them to um, the next session on the open forum. So maybe just as we go to break, a couple of comments. Um, I think Peter earlier referred to the fact there's a lot of people on the call today. I'm really proud to be able to say that we have uh, over 700 participants um, uh, registered for today, uh, representing uh, 12 countries as well, uh, 12 international countries. And so um, for those of you who this is not necessarily your normal work day, we really appreciate you taking the time to join us. Um, we do plan to take a break. We're just at the sort of the halfway mark. So um, since we're running a little earlier, we'll take a 20 minute break. We will be back online sharply at 2.40 for more updates, including Caddis approach to listening, engaging with indigenous peoples and, communi and communities, our new post-market drug evaluation program that launched uh, the, earlier this fall. Um, our discussion about common misconceptions about Cadith, our myths busting portion, and then our open forum. So we'll see you back here in 20 minutes. Thanks everyone. Welcome back everyone. Bienvenue à tous. I'll turn the podium over next to Heather Logan. Heather is Cadith's executive strategy lead and she's going to uh, lead, uh, lead and coordinate the next set of updates. Over to you. Thank you very much, Suzanne. Merci et bonjour à tous. Uh, my name is Heather Logan. I'm the executive strategy lead, as Suzanne mentioned. And thank you for making time uh, to spend it part of your afternoon with us today. I have the pleasure of bringing forward two agenda items today. One is to give you an update on our work uh, with, for, and about Indigenous peoples, and also inclusion, diversity, equity, and accessibility, otherwise known as IDEA. Uh, and also then to pass it over to my colleague, Terry, who'll talk about the post-market drug evaluation program. So uh, if you're asking why Cadeth, why now, why focus on the health and wellness of Indigenous peoples or on inclusion, diversity, equity and includes, uh, accessibility, I would say why not? Why not now? It's time as an organization. This er there is a sea change happening all around us in the world. Uh, and each of us individually are becoming aware of the unequalness or how we may not be treated equally across, uh, across the, our populations. Uh, and that our unequalness disadvantages uh, and marginalizes far too many. Um, pardon me. So we're not facing a blank slate. This is not a starting point. We do have several landmark reports uh, and documents, some of which are highlighted on this slide. Uh, and they're available to guide our work and our thinking forward. They include recommendations that are profoundly influenced by the realities of an indigenous peoples and communities and our collective and individual opportunity to be better, to do better. Uh, we are told these documents uh, and in other ways that picking some and leaving others is not the way to go, that you need to think of all of the recommendations and the observations in these reports collectively. They work most effectively when you think that way. The stories, there are stories that galvanize us. There is one that is not on this slide and it's the death of Joyce Esawan, a 37 year old mother of seven children who died surrounded by people who were trained to help her, who in spite of everything failed her. The murder of George Floyd, whose death is a reminder of the unequalness in our society and the anti-Asian racism that many experienced as our pandemic, the global pandemic began and lingered. These stories and others like them, while hard to hear and so much harder to watch, must change us. Many organizations are changing. They're working to address inclusion, diversity, equity, and accessibility, uh, and to be allies, advocates, and amplifiers of those who are deserving, uh, but who do not always experience equity. And we are among them at Cadeth as an organization. We have made great progress, but we know we have so much more to do. Our Cadeth board is very actively engaged in discussions about IDEA and about Indigenous health and wellness, and providing guidance and setting expectations for us as an organization and as individual employees of the organization. We have employee-led resource groups who've been here and ready to support the organization for some time as it goes through change going forward. We have great partners to rely on and to learn from, including the Canadian Partnership Against Cancer, Healthcare Excellence Canada, uh, Can Healthcare Excellence Canada uh, the Canadian Institute for Health Information, uh, and the Canadian Medical Association, to name just a few. 
Uh, on the left-hand side of this slide, I, what I'd really like you to focus on are some of the factors that are influencing our world and how we're changing as an organization. Down the left-hand side, really you see that the world around us is changing in so many ways, in ways you've experienced day to day, some of you. Uh, on the right, what I'd like you to focus on are where we're changing as an organization. So I would call out to you on the right-hand side, it's broken down by Indigenous health and wellness and IDEA, three things with respect to Indigenous health and wellness. We did invest, because of our leadership of our Chief Executive Officer, in a Settlers Initiatives Project. That was a work led by Jeff Mason, one of our staff, and it came up with uh, a number of short and medium-term recommendations, all taken together, to advance us as an organization and as staff. Two, our board recently has been thinking and working through, with the help of an organization called Pipiquan Patakwan, a reconciliation statement to set the tone for how we move forward as an organization, and I, you'll hear more about that soon. Uh, and three, just today, I'm very proud to announce that we have posted a new position, Strategic Partner, Indigenous Engagement and uh, Partnerships Role. That is a permanent position. If you know of people who are hungry for change and want to help the organization move forward, please share the posting with them and encourage them to reach out to us. And soon, we will have an Indigenous engagement strategy so we can reach out to Indigenous peoples, governments, communities and organizations in a good way to start to figure out how we can use our resources to support their priorities. From an idea perspective, we also have been working with an external organization to help us understand where we, where we stand relative to our peers and where there is an opportunity to do better. I'm also pleased to announce that we have also posted a brand new permanent position, a strategic partner, inclusion, diversity, equity, and inclusion. Similarly, if you know people hungry for change, please have them look at the posting and reach out to us. We've made some great strides in a year. We, we are not the organization from this perspective we were a year ago, and tomorrow will look even better. So finally, some important learning to guide our work. Um, number one, we have recommendations uh, from the reports you saw on an earlier slide, from the recommendations of the settler initiatives, from the work we've done in the reconciliation statement and with Indigenous peoples, uh, we know, though, that the, our priorities should be guided by Indigenous voices. And so those priorities will change as we start to engage more fully, and we look forward to that. Number two, to make sure that we have strong leadership to support this at the very highest level in the organization. Our board is engaged, our CEO is engaged, and we will need the leadership of the organization represented at the panel and, of course, many of our speakers and staff at the management level and staff level as well as committees to help us move this forward. That's also true from an, an idea perspective. And finally, uh, I mentioned our work with Pipiquan Patakwan uh, and with Indigenous leaders. They've presented, they've come and talked to us, they've helped us understand and learn so that we can be better allies, advocates and amplifiers of the experiences and realities of an Indigenous people and those who are also equity deserving populations across our country we know as Canada. So we look forward to the sea change that's about to happen in our organization and hope you'll join us on that journey. And with that, I'm going to hand it over to Terry uh, Huja, who's the inaugural director of the Post-Market Drug, uh, post Drug Evaluation Program. Over to you. Thanks, Heather. Uh, bonjour tout le monde. Uh, my name is Terry Huja, and, and Heather said I'm, I'm the director of the Post-Market Drug Evaluation Program. So I'm really fortunate. I mean, Heather's, it's a, a challenging segue, but we're talking about change. And I think this is one of those things. This is change and a different type of change. But i um, really happy to present um, the shiny new tool in our toolbox. Really excited to, to talk about uh, the post-market function that we're bringing to Cadet. So I'm going to start by a little bit of a history lesson really quickly um, where this is coming from. So uh, it was late last year that it was announced that we were awarded the opportunity to build a new program and network here at Cadet, and, and that's exactly what we did. So we first put in place the post-market drug evaluation program at Cadith, and within that program, we've created a uh, network. And this is a pan-Canadian network that's going to be focusing in on looking at some of this real-world evidence and how it applies to some of the decisions that need to be made by the system. So this new program was kicked off in September of this year, so we're still, still quite fresh, uh, and we're going to walk you through some of the, the pieces of this program. So what was the objective? And you know this fairly simple diagram outlines the simplicity, really, of what's behind what we're trying to accomplish, despite the complexity of what we're trying to do. So in our system, we know there's a lot of clear health policy issues and decisions to be made. And, and a lot of times, that requires the use of real-world evidence, real-world data. So our idea is to identify 
some of these health, pol health policy issues and then anchor those with real-world data, analyze, appraise the available data with a lot of the stuff that uh, was introduced today by Nicole and the frameworks that we're putting forth, and then to decide if we can take that information and allow for some of those decisions that need to be made to be made with evidence this time and, and have that impact. So that's uh, at its core what we're trying to accomplish. So we did that then by putting together a network and we've called this network, we've given it the brand of Colab and Colab clearly is a play on words for collaboration as you can hear. I think that's another word that we've been saying a lot today because it's very important to what we do here at Cadeth. And the second is the, the intent that we have several labs, several research teams across our country that will allow us to do this work. So ge geographically, you can see here are some of the sites that we have, our teams that are part of Colab and some of their data centers. And we've tried our best to be as pan-Canadian as possible um, based on the skills that we require and those who applied to the program. I'll walk you through a bit of who makes up this team. And I, I don't think what's important here is to go through each of these teams. I just wanted to highlight a few things. So first off, that we have a variety of types of teams. So this first uh, group is the Core Network Partners. They've been granted uh, for three years to allow to be the foundational teams of our network. Um, they bring a variety of skill sets, including health economics, their ability to do HTA, systematic review, uh, observational research. And we're also really happy to introduce our ability to now tackle oncology-based queries and questions. We also have network collaborators, and these are folks that are at the ready to participate and assist with our queries. They also bring a variety of skill sets, including more observational research in oncology. And then we have a third group of specialty collaborators that we will contract as required. They bring a really great niche skill set. Um, never really knowing what questions are going to be posed to us, we need to have the ability to scale up and pivot and uh, adjust based on the needs that we have for those queries. Um, some of the teams that we currently have in place to assist us uh, include a group out of uh, BC that looks at safety events in the ER setting, some pharmacogenomics, our ability to look at health policy. So you can see we have quite the mixed skill set, uh, which is really our intended, um, our, our, our intention. So uh, when we built this network, I wanted to highlight just a few, this is obviously not an exhaustive list, but a few of the features that we wanted to make sure we considered. So the first off was that we wanted to centralize a lot of the function to allow for efficiencies and to allow for consistency and predictability in what we're going to do. So queries will be coming in through all of the committees and jurisdictions that we engage with, and they will come into our operations center here at Cadeth uh, and our, within our PMD team to take a look at the question coming in, what is the appropriate team, what are some of the timelines and uh, products that need to be produced. Um, we will also be the spot that helps communicate and allow for that collaboration within our own network. Next, uh, some really great work gets produced, uh, not only by Cadeth, but other groups doing similar types of things, and that tends to fall short in, in cases where that information doesn't disseminate beyond the customer. Um, also, who are you speaking to? So, you know, the, gone are the days of really long, lengthy reports and, and, and jargon, uh, and people really want to hear the crux of the story. What is the evidence actually saying? How is this going to help with my decision making? And so we really wanted to invest in some of that knowledge mobilization and dissemination. And so we've embedded um, a resource within the team to allow us to do that effectively and really custom tailor what we're producing to what the customer's needs are. Last, we've um, introduced an advisory committee, and, and this network advisory committee is a bit distinct than your traditional advisory committee in that they're not um, necessarily involved with the day-to-day -day operations of how we're going to be executing our queries. Instead, we wanted a strategic group to help us make sure that we're continually innovating and making sure that we're ahead of the curve. We also wanted to bring in multiple stakeholders. So we have you know, the usual players, so we have the academics and researchers and pairs, but we've also included the patient voice. We also have clinician voice. We also have brought industry to the table to really have that fruitful, fulsome conversation and allow us to consider many more perspectives than perhaps we have traditionally. Um, here's just a schematic to kind of illustrate some of those players and, and how they can contribute to that conversation. Uh, and again, we wanted to make sure that we're get hearing from all these voices. So where does PMD fit into the drug review life cycle? And again, we've, we've heard about early scientific advice today. We've talked about our reimbursement review program. So we fit on the tail end of that. And, and as Nicole had mentioned, you know, RWE is involved in a variety of points in how CATH does business. We're just now yet another area where we can incorporate some of this information. So early scientific advice has an opportunity to help guide some of the RWE that's included in the clinical uh, evidence packages that are put forward. 
Um, we have a market, uh, we have our, sorry, reimbursement review that allows us to look at single drug submissions or some of the HTA that's produced just prior to shortly after market entry. And then you can see that the blue, large blue trail is this post-market drug evaluation period. Um, this period allows us to take a look at information, evidence, and data that is accrued once uh, a molecule has entered the market and patients are now actively taking this molecule. Um, so how can we use this information? How can the system use this? How, th how can this benefit us? So this is, again, not an exhaustive list, but just a few uh, of the key points that I wanted to highlight. So first off, uh, we've heard today that you know Canada is really data rich. We have some great assets within our country. So how do we leverage that? How do we force that into being useful for those who need to make decisions? And so awareness of this is really great. Helping foster partnerships and access to this data is really, really great. And then using it in a, in a relevant fashion is fantastic. So the next is to bring some of this information to the decision makers. Having post-market data in hand when you're making decisions is really, really valuable. Um, hearing firsthand from those decision makers, we've been told we really need evidence. Uh, many of the decisions we're forced to make are in absence of evidence, which is a scary thought. So can you help us get some information? And that's what we're going to try to do. The next is to support formulary management in appropriate use. So at the time of recommendation or reimbursement, we don't always have all the facts. We have what was provided at the time because that's what the clinical trials have produced. But now having access to this post-market information really will allow us to make sure that we're making, well, we have made good decisions. And if we haven't, how do we pivot? How do we improve access perhaps if needed? Or how do we modify that? Um, it also is going to create now a mechanism for us to have a more coordinated generation of post-market data. If we have obvious needs for, for post-market data because of a, an urgent unmet need and so something is fast-tracked but there's clearly uh, a sparsity of data, we can identify that early so that we're positioned to gather that data to have consensus on the appropriate outcomes. These are all really, really valuable tools. And last, um, perhaps as a barometer for effectiveness of costly or novel therapies. So a lot of these are really, really costly, but there's an unmet need, and so they're brought to market. Well, was that the right decision? And can we take a look at some of the data to see if the price and the access matches what was seen uh, in, in, in reality? Um, so at that point, I will, I will stop, and I will pass it back over to you. Suzanne, thank you. Thanks, Terry and Heather, merci. Um, Heather, a couple of questions have come your way. So um, the first one is, uh, can you tell, tell a little bit more about what exactly are settler initiatives? That's a great question, thank you. Uh, so settler initiatives, we are a settler organization uh, and uh, based in history, newer to the newer organization and newer approaches. Uh, and so settler initiatives would look at um, some of those entities like us that would have uh, started to address Indigenous issues more fully or in different ways that we can learn from. Also speaking with uh, those who are Indigenous to understand how to best approach engagement and working together with them to address their priorities. Uh, so it's really the sum total of activities that are happening in organizations just like Hadith. And how are they starting to work together in a much better way with Indigenous populations? Thanks, Heather. Um, Heather, I, I think I know the answer to the next question, um, but I, I'm going to ask it to you um, at this point. Um, does the CADETH, does CADETH, CDEC, and PERC processes at this point in time include a specific consideration of Indigenous impacts of the recommendations um, and on their reimbursement criteria? If not, will there be guidance in the future provided? And finally, you know, any reflections on what should be done if a CADETH recommendation or recommendation criteria has the potential to specifically bias against Indigenous or other marginalized groups? So I, I would say, having spent a little bit of time working with the pharmaceutical review team and understanding their work, I'm looking over at my colleagues who work in this day to day. Uh, available evidence is absolutely considered by the expert committee, by our teams that review that evidence to bring it forward for consideration by the committee. I think historically we have not had access to the right information to have a good discussion about the impacts of use of technologies in these populations. And so extrapolation has been required and really the need for an Indigenous voice to help us understand truly what is that impact and how is it felt in those populations has been lacking in our system overall. Um, 
the good news is there is a lot more evidence, both coming from indigenous communities, so community-based research. That evidence base is really growing. Uh, and so we'll look forward to incorporating that even more. The one other thing that I would say is we have engaged with the Canadian Institutes for Health Research, or CIHR, who have a very active and very substantial effort in this space. And they are also identifying how to better incorporate, how to better engage in research and in analysis of evidence. And we're trying to partner and leverage the work that they're doing to be better ourselves. Thanks, Heather. And again, I think just what's really important about um, the presentation that Heather gave in particular is we're at the very beginning of a journey. There's been a tremendous amount of good work and good intention, um, but we're just at the beginning. And as she indicated, bringing individuals, um, uh, uh, Indigenous individ individuals and consultants in to help us so that we actually can co-create and understand what it is that um, communities want and need, mm -hmm. um, not what it is that we think may, may be wanted or needed. And I think for us, that's been a real journey to get to this inflection point. So with that, uh, there are other questions. I'm gonna hold them uh, till the end. I'm gonna turn it over to our myth-busting session. And so this part of the ad uh, agenda is one that I'm really excited about. I hope it's something that we see more of from Cadith. Um, whether it's through this type of forum or in other presentations or with my communications colleagues, things that we want to be able to get out um, into the public domain. As I'm sure you're aware, Cadith doesn't just host events. We attend and we present at conferences and meetings that are organized by different stakeholders in the healthcare space, whether they're patients, industry, medical device industry, governments, university, or research groups. And we do them both here in Canada, individual to some jurisdictions, and we do them internationally. We also listen. When we're not talking at those events, we are listening. We are listening to the formal presentation, to attendees' questions, and to comments, to hallway chatter. And we're reading. We're reading studies and reports and posted presentations in social media about HTA, about CATA specifically, and sometimes what we hear or read about Cadith and our work isn't accurate. Sometimes, in fact, it's very misleading. Let's be clear, sometimes it's right. So I'm not standing up here saying it's never right. But that is the point of the myth busting. Where we live in an age where misinformation and disinformation are prevalent to ever, to, with apologies. We live in an age where misinformation and disinformation are pre prevalent to everyone's detriment. Going forward, we will make sure that accurate information about Cadith is available. Today, we're gonna to discuss some of the most common myths and misconceptions that we hear about ourselves. We also plan to make information and supporting data about these and other misconceptions available on the Cadith website in the near future. I'm going to ask Brent Frazier to kick things off. Uh, thanks, Suzanne. Uh, so I've had many opportunities to attend events and present at, at various meetings with different stakeholder groups. And one of the questions that uh, often comes up or assumptions that are made is that we only follow one process for all drug reviews, uh, regardless of the uh, treatment type, uh, whether it's for rare diseases or if it's for conditions where there are already treatments that are available. So I'm happy to talk to this particular point. Uh, it's important for you to know, and I think it came through in a number of presentations today, that CADIS review process is fit for purpose. So what we do is we use a standard set of review criteria, but we augment that or adjust that depending on the overall complexity of a particular product. Uh, Mandy, I think, quite succinctly uh, went over the complex review process that we have within our review structure, which includes greater consultation with clinical experts as part of the review process. In some cases, we may actually convene a pan-Canadian panel of specialists to help provide us guidance uh, within that particular review. We do include um, other data, non-randomized studies, real-world evidence. Uh, we look at potential implementation considerations to help support a recommendation. And we may also include an ethics uh, review as part of the um, dossier that goes forward to our expert committees. So I'm not going to go into a lot of details as the type of drugs that was uh, outlined in uh, Mandy's presentation, but uh, as she mentioned, gene therapy uh, is one of the key areas that we do know we have to have a more complex review 
rare diseases as well. And so everything that I've outlined just in this response is identified in our procedures document. So you can familiarize yourself with some of those components through that. And as Mandy also mentioned, we really welcome questions. If you have a technology that you think is very complex, engage with us early, take advantage of the pre-submission meetings, and talk to us about your product and what additional information data you have and what information might be uh, needed in order to help support a particular review. And I'll pass it over to Leslie for the next part. Thanks, Brent. And the next misconception is that um, Kadith only assesses evidence and delivers recommendation on drugs. And I alluded to this in my presentation earlier um, that we do a lot more than, than drug reviews and the devices, clinical intervention, surgical procedures, diagnostic tests, medical procedures, um, digital health as well, is all encompassed under the health technology assessment definition. And so our work does span more than drugs. In fact, for all of the work that Kadath has done so far this fiscal year, 54% have been on device and intervention topics with the remaining 46% on drugs. Um, and so our work in this area is quite expansive. And so it's, as I mentioned earlier, it's not about just medical devices. We've done remote monitoring programs, virtual care, as you've heard, uh, safety and effectiveness of peer support programs, internet delivered cognitive behavioral therapy, different surgical procedures, um, and virtual care. And that's just some of the work that we've done and is underway currently. Over the course of the pandemic, we've really seen a wave of investment into new technologies and innovative technologies with complex te technologies. And this is leading to complex decisions and significant challenges within the healthcare system. So as Canada's drug and health technology agency, our role is to anticipate those trends, anticipate the emerging needs, help leaders understand the shifting landscape as it relates to all categories within health technology. And now I pass it over to Nicole. Thanks very much, Leslie. Um, as CADIS chief scientist, I spend a lot of time thinking about methodologies and our evidence products. Uh, one of the misconceptions that I'm aware of um, is that we only use quantitative data and that any qualitative data or um, lived experience information is considered supplementary and not part of uh, the core part of our reviews. So uh, in reality, we consider, yes, quantitative data, but also qualitative data uh, and lived experience knowledge as an integral part of the work that we do. It is core to our evidence appraisals, it is core to our processes and informs the way we conduct health technology assessments and also recommendations for decision makers. Certainly we use qualitative methods on a number of ways to investigate and describe patient need, perspectives and lived experiences and outcomes that are important to the patient uh, and community themselves. We also use this kind of information or evidence to help us understand the meaning uh, and the meaningfulness of results um, and certainly to guide input in, into economic models and also to examine factors for the feasibility of implementing new technologies into the system. So in order to uh, continue to anticipate, transform, and innovate uh, our strategic pillars, the qualitative research team here at CADIF continues to expand the kinds of evidence that informs health technology assessment for leveraging and by-leveraging qualitative methods. We we'll continue to strengthen the rigor and transparency of the way that we do our work and how we conduct and report that kind of qualitative evidence. We continue to apply uh, qualitative evidence to uh, some perspectives such as an ethical perspective and an equity lens. And certainly we uh, continue to incorporate qualitative methods and evidence into the way we deliberate and appraise our work. So globally, CADIF is actually considered a, a leader in conducting qualitative uh, evidence and uh, research in the health technology assessment space. And our team is often asked to present internationally around the work that we do. So next, I'll turn it over to Heather Logan, who will respond to one last myth for CADIF today. 
Thank you very much, Nicole. Merci. Uh, so anyone who's interacted with CADF knows we are a complex organization. It's natural, therefore, over time that misconceptions, like the ones you've heard so far, um, come about. And so I'm really glad to have uh, some time to talk about this topic. So the myth you see on the left-hand side, the misconception, is that we've responded to many times, uh, is that CADF only considers clinical and economic evidence in it re its reimbursement reviews, uh, technology reviews, and health technology assessments. In reality, we actually include a lot of information. Information from patients, caregivers, the associations that represent them, and clinical societies and individual clinicians is some of the most important input that we receive. It helps us understand the on-the-ground practical application and impact of some of the technologies we review. We also work to incorporate patient perspectives and lived experiences into our reports so you can see what we hear. Uh, Leslie mentioned our work on peer support programs uh, for youth mental health in that project. We engage service users, people who are dealing with an ex this and experiencing and uh, supporting patients, and support workers, of course, who help us make sure the final report would be relevant to the work they do and reflect the realities day to day on the ground. Uh, through this engagement, we could better examine the issues uh, of equity and inclus inclusiveness uh, and the experiences of youth in underserved communities. Environmental considerations you heard from Laura earlier today are also becoming more important in all of the work that we do uh, and must be reflected in our work. We are part of an international network of agencies for health technology assessment looking at this. CADF is a member of a learning group on environmental uh, sustainability. Um, we're working with jurisdictions to better understand uh, where CADF can add value in this space uh, and when it comes to climate change and sustainability. Uh, and so there's all kinds of different inputs that are included and we hope you see that reflected. You heard some changes to the pharmaceutical review reports and the way that we're presenting information. So we hope you'll see the complexity of the information that we include in what you read. I'll pass it back to you, Suzanne. Merci, Heather. Uh, with with that, I'd just like to say as we open up the open forum at this point, we do have some questions that were submitted earlier. We appreciate that it's a long day, um, but if you do have any outstanding questions, please feel free to throw them in the uh, Q&A tab and they'll get fed over to me. If you have your own favorite myths or questions that you've always wondered if they're true, you certainly can ask us those and if we don't know the answer at this point, they'll feed into a list of things that we'll want to follow up on. Uh, so with that, I'm going to start off with a, a couple of questions that have, have come in um, uh, over the course of the last couple of hours. Um, and I'm actually going to go back, Leslie and Joanne, to a clarification of the question that was asked earlier uh, about digital health tools. So the question is, as an example, I'm thinking about apps, for example, that skin patients use to diagnose themselves. There are also informational apps and it can be tricky to figure out whether the information is correct or valid. It's a shame to put this task on patients' shoulders without any guidance. Uh, so any feedback or response to that question, Leslie? Uh, thank you for the clarification and this is actually something that we've been asked uh, quite a bit in the past and also what our role is in the space and where others fit into the space of validating um, apps that are out there. There are thousands of them um, that are available and they are apps that you can download anywhere and so not necessarily going through um, a process to evaluate the effectiveness or, or value of these applications. And so um, as I'm aware right now, there isn't something that exists that, that does go through and assess each app, but this is something that we've talked about quite a bit in the past. We've talked about with our other partners, um, other members of the Pan-Canadian um, health organizations to to determine where where who who is in the space and how we could potentially do that uh, I'm not sure if Joanne has anything to add to that I, I see she's come off camera or is nodding so thanks for that Leslie and thanks for that clarification Suzanne and um, whoever asked that question so um, I'll echo what Leslie suggested um, there are a number of frameworks out there I don't think they're necessarily coming from uh, patients perspectives but I will mention that there are also initiatives uh, sort of from the private sector and some government bodies that are looking at apps I don't think they're doing the kind of assessments that we are doing um, but there is uh, some database or some annotation that is available. And so um, 
if uh, whoever asked the question um, contacted me, I'm happy to share that information. Um, uh, we are looking at things to uh, to see what might be our role in this space um, and uh, doing that thinking um, as we speak. Thanks, Joanne and Leslie. Um, I, there is a, a thank you for uh, the report that you gave on the, the comprehensiveness of the medical devices and clinical interventions. And it's noted that this is becoming an increasingly important area for many patient communities and something that perhaps is, is relatively new to some of those patient communities. Um, two, two parts to the question. Um, can you speak to the, uh, the work of your, direct, your directorate uh, for exceptional access for patients across the jurisdiction? So I guess, did it come up at all in the summits, Leslie? Um, you know, there are clear processes in many jurisdictions about pharmaceuticals and exceptional access. Is it something that, that, that is top of mind at this point in time? I know it's nothing we're doing, but I, I don't know if anything come up in your summit about that. Uh, it actually didn't come up in the summit, but it is something that, that we've heard a little bit about, but it isn't something, as Suzanne said, that, that we're developing or working on, but certainly some emerging technologies that aren't yet in the system, aren't yet being used, aren't maybe even not even approved, um, and I know the special access um, program for that, but in terms of priorities and what is potentially coming to Cadeth in that space, um, not hearing anything specifically. Thanks, Leslie. The second part of the question is, I think I think one of you may have alluded to this in your comments. Um, in response to this, these changes, will there be any changes to how patients and caregivers and patient organizations can inform the medical devices and inter interventions work? Yeah, absolutely. So we do work very closely with our patient engagement team um, when we're identifying topics, when we're prioritizing topics, when we're refining topics to ensure that what we're doing is going to is going to resonate and meet the need, but also to inform the outcomes that we're assessing in the work that we do. Um, and so that that is work that is ongoing with with all of the the larger projects that we do. Um, but in addition, some of the some of the other projects we do have that patient engagement throughout the process when we're seeking feedback. Um, on the reviews, but also gathering the input um, for the different considerations for implementation um, in the recommendations. And so this is definitely an area that we, we do engage with our patient engagement team. Um, and then with some of the additional work that we're doing around the round tables and the summits and with that engagement, um, one of the ones I mentioned for the expanded engagement in the future, patient groups are on that list for the next step for, for that one. And so we will we'll be reaching out. Thanks, Leslie. And I think at this point, one more question for you, and then I'll promise to move to someone else. Um, just to clarify, um, did you say how it was possible to get access to the recent summit uh, for genetic uh, testing, uh, the report for that work? So it's not ready yet. Uh, we don't have the report yet. We are in the process of preparing that report. Once it is done and once it has been shared internally as well as with the participants of the group, we do hope to publish that and so it would be available. Um, but that's something that is probably happening um, in the last quarter of this fiscal. Thanks. Um, and Nicole, I'm going to ask this question of you. Um, it, there's a question that says, has there been or is there any external independent evaluation on CADIS patient engagement processes? Um, how, do, how do we know that we're not missing out on real world views um, as well as opportunities to improve processes and hopefully outcomes? Uh, th thanks very much for that question. I, I think uh, a formal process, I would say, perhaps not, but one of the things that we are look, uh, we're certainly do on a regular basis is we have a patient and community advisory committee. Uh, and this is a group of 12 individuals with lived experience who, who look at our processes and the way we engage and the way we deliberate uh, and the way we actually look at our reports and communicate. So they're often um, a source for us to talk about um, the way we actually do our business. The other ways that we reach out are uh, on a number of fronts. We actually leverage or work with patient communities directly or we receive patient input. Uh, and I think that there are opportunities to continue to expand the scope of how we do that in, for example, creating patient pools 
or even being in that anticipate role where if we know that there's a technology coming, ensuring that we have the patient population needs and, uh, and experiences available to us. So that's, that's a great idea is having an external review. We're trying to be as comprehensive as possible, but we can certainly think about that and go back and have a report back on that. Thanks, Nicole. Um, uh, someone commented they appreciate the myth-busting presentation, and I think this question I'm going to uh, raise to both Brent and Nicole, you may want to weigh in on this one as well. Um, uh, well, there's agreement that CATA staff do broadly consider all types of evidence um, in, beyond quantitative evidence in its work. Do expert committees like CDEC actually have frameworks in place to ensure that they place equal emphasis across all of the domains and evidence in front of them? versus over-indexing on RCT, for example, versus clinician and patient input. I don't know, Brett, if you want to go first. I can start, I guess. <laughs> um, not necessarily a formal framework, but I think our committees are quite used to uh, discussing non-randomized data, uh, looking at the totality of the, which one of our members hates that word, but looking at the totality of evidence that is in front of them and um, really working with the uh, clinical experts that often call into our meetings to help sort of take some of the randomized control data, but also use some of the non-randomized data to see how does that inform what the clinical trials are telling us? And um, does that address some of the gaps that they seem to, that they've identified within the uh, trial frameworks? So the two work very closely with one another, so I wouldn't say that there is one framework for RCT data and another framework for non-randomized control data. Uh, I think it's through the deliberations, all of that information is brought together uh, at the table, and um, the group themselves will look at that and discuss what the importance of the various pieces are. I think the other parts to just consider is the patient input process and the clinician input process. That, those are two other pieces of information that would also come in to help inform the discussions around the clinical data and uh, the ultimate recommendation that the committee issues. Thanks very much, Brent. Um, maybe just to add on, um, we certainly don't wait each of the pieces of evidence along the way. Um, and as we deliberate on different kinds of evidence and expand that evidence base and have the discussions at the table about the different kinds of evidence, whether it be patient input, whether it be clinician input, and or implementation issues along the way, alongside of the clinical evidence and the RWE perhaps, um, we certainly could do uh, enhance the way we communicate about it. So I think that's some of the work that we'll be doing in the next uh, little while is to ensure that the, what is actually discussed at the deliberation table will be more clearly communicated. And maybe the last thing is that as we deliberate, you know, the first piece of evidence that goes at every deliberation table is the patient perspective before the clinical evidence. And so we actually set the stage for the disease and for the discussion. Thanks a lot. Nicole, this question is directed to you, but I, it might actually be Leslie that wants to weigh in in part on this. So um, it, thank you for the myth buster again on the qualitative data topic. Can you share any examples of how Cadith is considering lived experiences and qualitative data in a technology where the quantitative data is not robust and how these qualitative uh, data were considered in the outcome of the recommendation? Leslie, do you want to go first on that one? I think there's been a couple of uh, novel approaches used this year. Yeah, and so we have done, um, with our recent work on peer support for youth mental health, um, the, that wasn't weighted heavily, there wasn't a lot of clinical information available, and so a lot more of that work was focused on the qualitative, um, on the qualitative research. And so that really formed the basis of that report and those conclusions. And we've certainly had other, and those ones didn't come with recommendations, um, but we've had other um, reports and recommendations in the past where the question really wasn't about the clinical effectiveness or optimal use. And so the information from the qualitative reviews really fed heavily into the deliberations for those recommendations. And so it really depends on the topic and the types of information that we're getting and what the purpose of those recommendations are, how it, how it weighs into, how it is used to inform those recommendations. Thanks, Leslie. 
Nicole, do you want to chime in? Yeah, perhaps maybe just to add on to Leslie's comment, certainly not every question can be answered with a clinical trial. So, I mean, we can answer efficacy and safety questions around a technology, but sometimes the questions are about need. Sometimes the questions are around utility. Sometimes the questions are around access, and that's where the opportunity is uh, to look at and conduct qualitative analyses. Thanks, Nicole. Um, and I, I was just going to comment as I'm reading through the forum questions. I know there's a real mix of people on, on this call, and so we're getting questions from lots of different perspectives. Um, there are a very, couple of very specific uh, uh, pharmaceutical-related questions. I'm going to do my best to ask them um, and get the uh, acronyms all right. Um, and uh, if, if it's something specific that we can't answer, just where a product is in, in the process, um, that will be highlighted. But if it, if it is something that we can answer either specifically or generally, we will do our best. So um, heads up to Brent. So a couple here. Um, so this is an inquiry by a patient, ALK positive cancer, regarding reassessment of oncology drug provincial funding approval. Can reconsideration occur after CADETH has approved as first line only and change to include second, second and subsequent lines of therapy, e.g. E remove conditions? Can reassessments happen within the three-year 2022 to 2025 timeline? This question is referring specifically to lor loratinib, which was only approved for reimbursement as first line, although the drug by design was created to cover mutations occurring from previous TKI use. Very few physicians would prescribe uh, lorlatinib as first line. These conditions do not uh, seem to apply to other publicly funded countries such as the UK or Australia. Um, so maybe just try to unpack a couple things within the question. Uh, it's important to understand that uh, when we do our reviews, it's based on Health Canada's approved indication and also based on what the manufacturer has submitted to us as a uh, request for reimbursement. We tend not to go outside of Health Canada's um, indication that's been approved for market in Canada. And so that's where you may see that some of the recommendations are specifically focused on certain lines of therapy. What we tend to see though is uh, manufacturers come in with fourth or third line or second line and then move down to first line. But certainly if there is data available in the other lines of therapy, that is something that the manufacturer could bring forward to us as a resubmission to have reimbursement in a uh, different line of therapy. It's difficult to comment on what other jurisdictions have done because it may be that they were approved through their regulator differently. They may have had a different package of information that was submitted to them for review. And that's why they came up with uh, different uh, funding recommendations in that case. I think it's also potential and manufacturers generally tend to go from uh, a niche or group of patients, which is third or fourth line on the regulatory side, and then move more broadly down to first line therapy. Um, what we would typically do is connect, if that's a uh, question that's coming up from our jurisdictions and a lot through our patient groups, we may go back to the manufacturer and ask them if they are planning on submitting uh, four additional lines of therapy. If the answer is no, that they have no interest in doing this, that could possibly be something that's done through our non-sponsored reviews, which Peter talked a little bit about earlier in the uh, presentation. So there are some mechanisms to do that. I think part of it is on the manufacturer's willingness, also whether data is available specifically for those other lines of therapy so that we can do an assessment and a recommendation but we would also engage the jurisdictions to make sure that they uh, want us to move down uh, that path and provide those guidances to them. Thanks, Brent. I know that was a long one to answer, um, but one more specific uh, drug question. In a recent recommendation for Selenexor, the price reduction statement was interesting in that it offered two discounts to reach the ICER threshold. One baseline, 93%, but a lesser discount, 81%, if sustained and durable OS benefit was achieved. 
So the question is, have you provided similar if-then type rec recommendations in other circumstances? And two, if this is helpful to manufacturers and payers in setting up outcome setting up outcomes-based agreement, will you expand this practice? Um, so I'm going to look to Mandy. I think this is one of the first times that we've actually provided uh, two different discounts within a recommendation. What typically happens within our reviews is our health, economist, uh, health economics team will run a number of scenarios based on the clinical data that has been submitted by the company. The company themselves may have also run a number of different scenarios um, based on whether what the um, um, reported outcome is. Uh, I think in this particular case there was a lot of discussion around the table about different uh, price points depending on what they think the drug could achieve in practice. Uh, I'm not sure this would become a standard uh, approach, I think because it did create a little bit of confusion around the table and how to word it so that the jurisdictions can take that information and work with it in order to negotiate with a uh, manufacturer to get a final rec, but I think I'll ask Mandy to supplement that. If yeah, thank you, and that, that's a really great question and, a, and an astute observation. Um, so I think this is really an example, as Brent mentioned, this is the first time that that has actually been done, but it's a really good example of the way that we're trying to, or the committees are trying to be more pragmatic, right, and trying to increase the impact of the recommendation so that they can actually be, you know, used in a meaningful way um, by, by the um, PCPA and by the drug plans. So this may be the first time that um, it's been seen for a, a pricing condition, but there are other instances where we've done sort of the if-then um, recommendation or condition within the other types of conditions in the recommendation. I think recently there was one within the last couple of months from a CDEC recommendation for renewal. So I don't want to speak to any product specifically, but but it's out there and and it's it seems to be the direction that you know we may be going. Thanks, Mandy. Much better said. Thanks, Mandy, very much. Um, and I just want to comment, the questions have been, are great and we'll do a few more. Um, but I, I do think it just highlights, hopefully, that um, you know some of the answers that you're hearing are things that we're just trying now. And again, I think it's important um, for us to be successful and to keep being able to respond to the environment, to be able to keep an open mind about the opportunities to innovate and try in a sandbox. Um, things that we may try may not work. And I think you know that's one of the things we recognize and some of the things we try may fail or n have un unintended consequences. Um, but it, it's great to know that people are watching us in a way to be able to identify those things that perhaps do look different than what we've seen in the past. Um, Leslie, I'm gonna direct this question to you is, um, you touched on this a little bit I think earlier, but how is medical devices and clinical interventions team getting involved in the review of companion diagnostics, specifically in the cancer space? Thanks, Suzanne, and thanks for the question. So this is actually related to the work that we're doing, um, that we held the roundtable for precision medicine, and companion diagnostics is likely the first um, place that we will start developing a framework, because that's the one that seems most top of mind and most in need at this point. And so we are um, working with the drug team here with what are the, what are the companion diagnostics um, required for the drugs that might be going through formulary reviews and then what can we do to support um, those, those reviews and what information can we provide. And so this is part of that work with the genetic testing, uh, precision medicine roundtable and the framework, um, but it's also something that we've been talking about and thinking about quite a bit with, with our colleagues in the drug team with how we can work together to coordinate a review process for the diagnostic as well as the drug. Thanks, Leslie. Um, this is kind of a statement, but I'm going to read it in case anybody out there in the, in the viewing land feels the same way, um, just so that it's on the record. Um, it, there's just a statement that says, with electronic submissions becoming far more common and easier for all users, is it possible that contact information and requirements for the drug programs be updated to include e-submission information, emails and addresses, et cetera, wherever possible? So if that's not something we're doing and it is something we can do, I'll turn it over to Brent. So I guess it would be good to clarify that question because I think what they may be talking about, the documents we receive, we receive through our collaborative spaces, but there are other documents that we require manufacturers to submit to individual jurisdictions. 
I think some jurisdictions accept that electronically, others may not. So we can certainly take this back to the group that we engage to see whether people are moving in that particular direction, but all of our uh, documents are electronic. Um, we're also having some discussion about whether or not it's even necessary to share some of that information, or whether it's necessary to submit that information to all jurisdictions. And we've had various responses in the past because for some it's a regulatory requirement, for others it's more by policy, and I think as many people know it's harder to change a reg than it is to change a policy. And so we are working through that uh, in a little bit more detail. Um, this question is, I think, for you as well, Brent. Um, I, Nicole may want to weigh in on with this as well, and this might actually be one of those myth-busting questions as well. Will CADF be able to take on board Project Orbis reviews now that you're moving to the RWE space? So, Brent, maybe if you want to start. Well, we're doing it now, <laughs> so I don't myth -busting. think... Myth-busting. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think that uh, it would be a particular concern for us. Uh, for those people who aren't familiar with Project Orbis, this is a regulatory accelerated approval process that was initiated by the FDA in the States where they share their document, guidance documents with other regulators and those regulators may make their decisions based off of these reports as opposed to redoing and recreating the same reports within their own uh, group. So that has really sped up the regulatory approval process. I would say one of the challenges, though, is all the downstream efforts. So you could get a regulatory approval within 30 days, um, which is obviously much faster than our 180-day re review time. We've also heard that sometimes manufacturers are not prepared for such a fast uh, regula regulatory approval because their economic models and their submission documents are not fully uh, prepared uh, within that time frame. So there's a bit of a lag in getting it to the HTA um, groups. So we are doing it. I don't think it would be impacted by RWE. Uh, I think if, if the sponsor wants to include some RWE data into their submission, they can certainly do that at that time period. Uh, I think it really depends on how quickly they can get that evidence together in order to submit it. Um, and that would be, I would suggest, independent of the Project Orbis uh, review timelines. Yeah, and maybe I could just add, I mean, it, it would really, the RWE would be used to complement any of the RCT data. And so if that's available, if a drug is in the system, that you can actually start to look at uh, how it's navigating through the system or the outcomes that are being uh, shown uh, by that work it can be included as a complementary piece of data. Thank you. Um, there's, this is a question I don't know who to send it to, so um, it might not even be a question that anyone can answer. So I'm going to start with, to what extent does Cadith envision use of micro-simulation modeling like the OncoSim model from CPAC as a key kind of evidentiary input into your assessment? I know there's people here I who will answer. know the answer. <laughs> it's not me. Well, I mean, thank you very much. I mean, this is something that our health economics team is looking at in terms of uh, can we have open source, open access kind of models, um, and then do we have uh, an ability to have a core model that we can adapt or adopt for different kinds of technologies. So, for example, the OncoSim is a cancer model um, and created by CPAC and Statistics Canada um, and can be updated with new data along the way and potentially other treatments along the way. So you can allow that to happen. And actually, just this week on an, a call with our international HTA colleagues, we all talked about wouldn't it be nice if there was an online, in, open, available micro simulation model that we could all agree upon and use, and then either to validate um, other models and or to use as a base case. So lots of thinking is going on in that particular space. Thanks. Uh, Heather, I'm going to direct uh, this question to you um, and, and, and Nicole as well. Um, how can we help small patient groups or marginalized patient groups, um, I'm combining a couple of questions, to develop robust patient submissions? Um, is, there, is there a place for us that we need to head for, for groups that sort of aren't typical and represented by, by larger patient organizations or more common uh, disease states? So um, maybe to you, Heather, first. Uh, sure. I may, actually, maybe Nicole answer first. She's more okay. closest to the patient engagement. I'll add after. 
Thank you. Well, I mean, I think that this is an opportunity for that collaboration and to call on our patient engagement team to think about ways of getting data or understanding the lived experience for the particular patient population. So we know that resources are scarce or even um, pot potentially expertise on what we're looking for. So this is where we can have a, a dialogue and try to understand what the needs are and then how do we incorporate it then into whether it's a pharmaceutical review or, or whether it's a device review, for example, or a formal health technology assessment. So collaboration and reach out to us. Okay. Heather. And I would really just add to that, uh, I think the experience of some of these small populations, very, very uncommon diseases, may be quite different than it is for more common diseases. The trajectory to get diagnosed, the travel, the effort required to get treatment, the trial and error, uh, may be quite different than it is for other populations. So I think we need to continue to be innovative and creative and listen to patients who are going through these experiences so we can capture those uh, as part of the review process. And maybe can I have a the, the other bookend, <laughs> bring it back. Um, perhaps, I mean, this is where, this is where real world evidence um, actually plays a role, right? So trying to understand how patients navigate through the system, understanding barriers, understanding access issues, understanding where patients live, understanding caregiver burden, that all plays a role. And so how do we take that information and then deliberate about it? So that's all part of the way what we're thinking about navigating in the, in the space of looking at health technology assessment. Last question for you, Nicole, and thank you to everyone who's been submitting questions. There's been a ton of them. Um, the last question actually sort of builds on where we were. Uh, Nicole, can you give us examples of how you'd like to see work differently done and more effectively uh, and creatively with data partners in the future to advance greater clinical and economic efficacy in Canada? I think um, we've traditionally used an academic model uh, and with the ability to um, use very robust methods and then use the academic forum or peer-reviewed literature to move forward. I think, as you heard earlier with the post-market drug evaluation, for the decision makers, they're particularly interested in having um, information in a much more timely manner than an academic paradigm, which is often 18 months for publishing, and if you're me, it's even slower. Um, and I think, uh, you know, there's an opportunity to reach out to a number of data holders and methodologists and thinking about the community who does that work and how do we actually support then our decision making. A lot of the work that academics do comes actually from public funding. Um, and so how do we continue to move that public funding into the public good? Thanks, Nicole. Um, as I said, we're drawing the, the open forum to a close at this point. Uh, thank you for all of the questions. And there are some remaining questions that certainly, um, you know, I will keep an eye on for myth-busting uh, questions in future. Um, at this point, um, the information session is almost at an end, but I do have other pieces of paper, so don't just hang up yet. Um, before we wrap up today, I wanted to give you a heads up about some operational changes at CADIS that we'll be sharing more broadly in the new year when they take effect. But just to let you know that we are um, restructuring and retooling our organization uh, to be able to deliver on our strategic plan to meet the needs of decision makers in a rapidly changing environment and to achieve the greatest possible impact. We'll be restructuring five business lines to be able to provide greater clarity and efficiency. And as you've seen today, a lot of our work does up, but up to one another or cross over. And so we'll be, we'll be making some changes. I'll just give a quick a couple of highlights um, at this point, but watch for more information to come out in the new year. Um, we'll be bringing our assessment programs for both the drug and medical devices under one umbrella of evidence, products, and services. Both Brent and Leslie will be continuing in their roles with the pharmaceutical review program and the medical devices. But I think as many of the questions are uh, highlighted today, there's the starting to be the connection between those areas so prevalent that there's greater opportunity for us to do our work differently and think about our work together. Uh, Nicole will lead a newly titled Scientific Evidence Methodologies and Resource uh, Business Unit, um, both as a Vice President and continuing as our Chief uh, Scientific of Officer. As she said earlier, her area will continue to oversee the rigor and quality of CADETH reports through methods, health economics, research information services, and publishing to in ensure the continued credibility of CADETH work. Heather Logan's area will be changing and be expanding to include strategic relationships and, in, and initiatives. It will be a place to build opportunity for new work at CADETH to consolidate our understanding of how health systems are responding to the challenges of today and tomorrow. 
To help us continue to prioritize and collaborate in this space, the demands being placed on all organizations, including health technology organizations, are growing daily. This team will also, as you've probably uh, noticed by the presentation of Heather today, will focus our efforts in the Indigenous relations as well as inclusive, di inclusiveness, diversity, equity, and accessibility. We will continue to be supported by corporate service, corporate strategy and services business unit led by our Vice President Megan Ashley Bowes. And last but not least, our people and culture business unit will continue its imp impactful work to recruit and support CADA's diverse workforce. I'm hoping and believe that this new structure positions as well for success going forward. I'm incredibly excited about what the future of CADA holds and I'm pleased to be able to share these uh, early highlights. I hope you can tell that part of the reason that I'm excited is the fact that so much has already changed in this year. We're only three quarters way through the first year with a plan that was only approved shortly before, before the beginning of this year. A tremendous amount of embracing of the new strategic plan has really made a difference. Quick reminder that the 2023 CADIS Symposium will be held May 16th to 18th here in Ottawa. The theme is Shaping Future Ready Health Systems. It is planned as a hybrid event with in-person and online options, making it the first in-person event for Cadith since 2019. The call for abstracts closes next Friday, December 16th, so please don't miss out. I can tell by the questions there's so many great uh, thought leaders um, attending. Um, if you have something to say and this is the right place for it, please do submit an abstract. As any good conference uh, or meeting ends with, please take a moment to complete the short survey about today's session and you can access the survey by clicking on the check mark button on the toolbar on the platform. And lastly, thank you for joining us today. I look forward to many more opportunities to meet, discuss and engage with you about our work. I am hoping that this coming year comes with more opportunities to meet in person, not just virtually. Merci de voir été de notre au plaisir de collaborer et de compter avec vous nouveau. Have a great day and thank you for spending this much time with us all today. Take care. <laughs>